Oh, uh, I don't actually have. I have one text thread with me and my two brothers. That is the only text thread I have. Really? Mm -hmm. There's like one going with the people that we're going on vacation with in February, okay. but that's a temporary one hmm. um, for vacation planning. But I don't have any ongoing, just conversational. I don't have any text threads that I've started. But you're you're part. I of get the I get put on text threads. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder how many is common. Oh, I don't know. Probably a lot. Really? I think it happens a lot. Yeah, I just have the one. Yeah. But also, I'm a I'm a I'm an Android, you're Android user, so Apple, people so I don't know if it's different. So pe people exclude me because. Oh yeah, because you're <laughs> freaking green messages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep, it happens. Deal with it. Yep, it always sends the text of like. Drew liked this message instead of just like a thumbs up. I never even do that. Like if I want to send an emoji, I'll send an emoji. I'm not double clicking or replying or commenting. Uh, I, don't, I, don't know. I don't know how it works. Talk to me. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. All right. You ready? I am ready. 119. One Here we go. Nine. <clears throat> Everything's 19. Okay. Welcome everybody to episode number 119 of the Goulet Pencast. Where fountain pens are still a thing. I'm Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we're here from Goulet Pen to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about caring for wood pens, each of our pen quirks that we annoy ourselves with, that should be interesting, uh, a sealable inkwell for dip pens, the parts of a Lamy feed and what's up with all those different parts and whatnot. Uh, why some inks stick to the side of the bottle and others don't. Stick to itiveness. It's, I, I'm not sure how deep of a dive that one will be. I have a lot of notes, but we'll see how long I go. Uh, and then we're gonna be spotlighting the Opus 88 Jazz and uh, we got an update on our turkey hammockness. So yeah, oh, you're stuck. I'm good. You're stuck. <laughs> all right, uh, but we'll kick it off with feedback. 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 Today's inaugural feedback Ooh. is by Phil Naunton. I like the radio voice. Yeah. 7181. <laughs> Just wondering, for no particular reason, does the Goulet team make the pen cast all in one swell foop, which I love. That is a great thing to say. <laughs> or otherwise that. in sections, like I often listen slash watch it. Mm. It does seem like a considerable amount of diligence and effort to keep that level of consistency going for what is often two hours or virtually more every week. Not many superheroes I know could do it. Well, oh. Phil, it's oh. remarkable how you view this in any way consistent, <laughs> but thank you. Um, I, I, we, like, we do break it up for basically a title in between the sections, but we... We record it all at once. Yeah, it's like like just continuous. now when we said feedback, like we don't actually stop recording. We just like say feedback and then yeah, we're like and now for some feedback and, and we then we both drop in, sit here like ding dongs for yeah. two seconds <laughs> so, to let the audio clear. But no, it is and then we it is one shot. Um, yeah, there have been maybe three edits in a hundred and eight in hundred nineteen episodes where like one of us accidentally said something about like, personal it, information about an employer. Like like no, we don't want that to be public information or something yeah. like that. Where we'll edit out, but like. Other than that, the, we don't. There is no editing. WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get. Oh God. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's a tech thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it is unedited. We do it all in one sw uh, swell foop, and um, <laughs> never heard that term no, before. That's by. really funny. Uh, and then uh, yeah, uh, yeah. We just we, it takes we, a lot of diligence, I guess. So we well, write down we write down what questions we're going to answer, and then like just a couple bullet points we want to make sure we we hit like as far as answers go because we do want the answers to be like somewhat decent, you know. Yeah. But apart from that, no, we just we just go, we just wing it. But yeah, um, there's no editing. Yeah, very very little. Just just the titles and the images. You know, the images get dropped in by our mm -hmm. part time videographer Tyler. Yep. Cool. Yeah. All right. We got another one. Um, yes. Next one comes to us from KDIY. To travel with a Kakemori nib, which is what we talked about last week, mm -hmm. I can recommend getting a Tachikawa T25 nib holder and use a Sharpie cap to protect the nib. It fits perfectly, keeps the nib protected, and can be carried in any pen case. Hmm. KDIY also mentioned that the T40 version of the Tachikawa comes with a cap. So the Tachikawa is a nib holder, Brian, but it is truncated. It is a shortened nib holder. Um, the T40 
has a little rubberized grip oh, as well as a clear. I'm looking um, it up because I'm like. Yeah, so you can get them thing. at like art stores, stationery stores. Oh. JetPens has them, you know, so. Uh, yeah, because it's a standard. I mean, it's a standard nib holder for like any calligraphy nib. But a stumpy one. Stuff. Yeah, look at that. Which, and it's got the same, it looks like a, the same like circular kind of uh It's like the plasticky the, entry yeah. point that the Kakamori has. The one that kind of like pops when you yeah, pull it out. Yeah, yeah very that's nice. cool. Okay. So. That's neat. I think we, we um, mentioned. Huh, these are neat. Uh, you know, hey, does anybody else have a better idea for that sort of thing? And please let us know. know. So, yeah, yeah, KDIY. Cool. All right. Now we know. Do, 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 do. What you got? All right. Uh, I have too many tabs open. I have. Let me just say that this name on uh, this first comment. Yes. Which is from ADHD addicted to life. So Yeah, it looks like addicted. Right. But, but with when, ADHD incorporated when you think about it, When you think about ADHD, you don't think that all that is phonetically is ad. But this person like committed to that. So it really does say addicted to life, but it's ADHD it's addicted. So living up to your name. Well there you done. go. Thinking outside the box. Love it. All right. Well, let's see what addicted to life 519 says. The chopper works fantastically. Swings like an ax, splits like a mall. I would recommend one for the collection. Well, there you go. You need a chopper, Sounds Brian. Like I need, yeah. Chop, chop. I do. I should probably count up how many axes and hatchets I have. That's I don't think it would be more than hammers because an ax is a little more specialized. And it's larger. Right. And it's definitely larger. Yeah. And they're more expensive. Yeah. But I got a, I got more than a few. But it's missing More a chopper. A I don't have a chopper. Might have to check that out. Like, I need a lot of arm twisting for that, right? All right. Evan Baznaw asked a question. Or said, no, didn't ask a question. Sorry. Misled. Misread my punctuation. Made a statement. I'd love to see that Varsity Refill Guide as a broken out video. It'll be useful in the future. Well, guess what, Evan? I was inspired. And we already shot it. And it's in the process of being edited. It'll be out in a couple of weeks. So yeah, it'll happen. Done in the can, as they say in the biz. Yes, and as a little teaser, I do smack the pen with a hammer to try to break it. Well, to show that it is not easily broken. But little little side side note here: I broke two of them in the process <laughs> because I was. Yes. I. <laughs> it takes some doing, I will say. So we have an internal Slack, which is a messaging <laughs> system that we have here at the Goulet Pen Company. <laughs> and Brian, you know, unbeknownst to anybody, sends out a message to our customer care team and says, hey, just so you all know, there is a point that yeah. if you hit a varsity <laughs> enough times with a hammer that it will crack. Yeah. It's like a varsity. It takes a lot, but it can be done. <laughs> and everybody's like, determined. Everybody's like, wait, huh? What? No, no context at all. No, no context. Yeah. It's like, what are you doing? Why is the owner yeah. of the company smashing products with a hammer in the privacy of his office? Glenn heard me though, because his office is behind I'm mine. I'm sure he did. And he heard me smacking Your office hammer. is actually right through this wall, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Like my office normally. So actually, when you're watching the pencast, you're looking at the same wall as our other videos. It's just the other side of it. Fun fact. I didn't even think about that. Yeah. We could drill a hole right through there and then you could just like see like a portal oh, through the other side. Oh, goodness. That's interesting. Wacky. Yes. Um, anyway, yeah. So we will have that guide coming out. Same concept as what I showed last week. But, but with 100% more hammer action. More hammer action for sure. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see here. Caleb, Cal, Caleb uh, 9648 says, one of my most reliably ready to write pens is my Monteverde Ritma. I was really skeptical about the magnetized cap, but it has never given me a hard start. How about that? We talked last week about deceptively <laughs> well sealing pens. And we talked you about Kaveco, we yeah. talked about Opus 88. I did not expect Monteverde to make the list. And I also, I would have further not have expected a magnetic cap Monteverde to make the list. But you know what? It's like, you could almost like pop the, sort of like when you pull the nib out of the Kakamori, mm -hmm. you can like the Ritmo, when you pull it off, it makes kind of like, it's a, it's kind of a, pops down like it. So that's like, there's a, there's a good seal in there. Yeah, there's not a lot of tolerance. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess in retrospect, it makes sense, but still the Ritmo. Yeah, how about that? That's like a sub $45 pen. Like, yeah. I don't know, that that's a problem. I mean, Granted, so are the Kaveco Sports, but yeah. still, like and we that. Had, and we had them right now with a free bottle of ink. So you and that sweet brown one that we talked about last week—that's brand new. So I don't yeah. know. Yeah, that that surprised me. So yeah. there you cool. go. Thank another you. another Thank dark you, horse of the ceiling. Appreciate it. Ability. Awesome. Thanks for the feedback, everybody. Leave us more in the comments. Um, all right, let's talk about some new stuff. 
Okay, we've paused for two seconds. <laughs> and uh, let's talk about some new stuff. We have the Delta DV Original mid-size fountain pen drew uh, in two new colors. So this is, I don't know how to pronounce this. Nobile, Nobile, Nobile. None of us around here know how to pronounce it. Nobile. But it's N-O-B-I-L-E. However you want to say that. I'm going to say Nobile. And Imperial Blue. B-L-U. Imperial Blue. Maybe it's just Imperial <laughs> Blue. 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 Uh, anyway, uh, despite the fact I'm butchering these names and being a joke about it, uh, they are limited edition pens and they're actually kind of cool. So they're $796. They are an investment, but they have a Yovo number eight gold nib. Wait. 18 karat gold nib. Gold, well, hold on. Does Yovo make number eight nibs? They do. Right. Since do. when? The, since a long time, I think. Not a lot of companies use them. But they're around. How about that? They're and around. This is our first pen with a Yovo number eight. Uh, yes, because we've had. I think the Monte Grappa that we had with the shiny lines. I don't think that was. I think a that Yovo was Bachman. That, that was like an old Monteverde nib that they had had on another pen way back when. That was not a Monteverde. Sorry, Monte Grappa. That was one. That was so that. Okay, so this is such a deep. That wasn't. I mean, we, we just here. didn't say that wasn't Yovo. We did a pen called uh, Shiny Lines. Yeah. And it had the nib that was used on the Jubilee pen from the year 2000, I think it was, um, that had a dove on it that was like a Pope-themed pen. Uh, and that was, a, I believe, a number eight size, but it was a Bach nib. Yeah, it was a weird number eight. If it was a number eight, it was like curved kind of funkily. Yeah, it was kind of different. So, but, yeah, this is our first it was a big Yovo nib. number eight. Yeah, and so, we, have the, we have the Jinhao number eight, which is steel. And not Yovo. And not Yovo. So, yeah, first Yovo number eight. But it's pretty cool. And we've had, oh, let's see here. I don't think we ever sold these in mass, but before Delta went under previously, we had at least special ordered a couple of the oversized Dolce Vitas, mm -hmm. which had number eight size nibs. But yeah, they, we never they were stocked made, those regularly. They were made by Bach at the time. I have yeah. one of those and it's really big. But this is not an oversized DV. It's not an oversized pen. Right. It's the same size as the other previous DVs that we had. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you might see it, it, you might see that it's an oversized nib somewhere, but it's not the pen itself is. It was a little unclear. Yeah. We were a little unclear at first until we actually got the pens. It's we like, saw the okay, word oversized, and we're like, oh, I remember yeah. have there being a DV oversized, but yeah, but it's not. It's not. So it's not the size of the Dolce Vita oversized no. previously. It's the m smaller one, slightly smaller. It's still a big pen with a big nib. It's still a big pen, yeah. and it's got the nib that's the size that the Dolce Vita oversized has. So right. honestly, in my opinion, it's the best of both worlds because that Dolce Vita oversized was a friggin' like pipe in your hands. It yes. was just like, it was like holding a PVC pipe. It was huge. Yeah. Um, this one is much more reasonable. It was like the actual girth of a cigar. Yeah, it was really yeah, big. Um, but this is good. This is more like a cigarello. Hmm. Um, is that a thing? I don't really, I don't smoke. I don't Probably. Um, and it's got an internal piston as well. So yeah. it looks, looks kind of like, it's got like the blind cap because they do like the captured converter. They call it the plus one or whatever it is. No, that was, was Converter plus? plus? Converter plus. That's what it was. You're thinking of the 39 plus one from Yes, Delta. which also had that, but again, that's a separate thing. Um, so yes, it has a blind cap for the piston, but then it's a piston. There's no there's no cartridge or converter to deal with. So anyway, it's got some cool stuff going on. Go check it out. The colors look really nice too. Uh, the blue is the best though, in my opinion. Um, next, we got Sailor. Has a new Silent, C-Y-L-I-N-T-E. So we got to be Sailor Silent Fountain Pen. But it's a new color, Patina. So the Silent was already a pen that was out. Uh, and so it's a new color. It's like a gunmetal type of a color or like a- It's like brown. How would you describe it? Yeah, it's like a brownish, like a rusty, yeah. not rusty. I'm doing a terrible job describing this color. It's like a brown but, sponge painting. Yeah. But it they, the actual process is much more involved, done with a lot of care. You can check out our product yeah. description. We've got a lot of, it's got some good information about like how it's done, who it done, yeah. who is who's it done by, whatever. Yes. Um, but it's very neat. And it has that metal grip section like the old Silent did. Yes. Uh, but patina, so it's like patina is like what you get if you, you know, leave metal out in the elements and it kind of like rusts and turns different colors and stuff like that. So it's meant to mimic that. But it's not just like old crappy metal. They like, it's good metal that they made look um, interesting. So 552 for that one. It's got the 21K nib on there. So that's pretty cool rad uh and then yeah metal grip gold hardware looks pretty sharp um then last but not least for me um we got some stuff on sale for banu we do we have the hanukkah oil 
we have the uh, ba, 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 ba. Christmas I'm Twinkle. Christmas, yep. And Couple then of, and then something else that I'm failing to remember. Yeah. We'll go on our website, check Banu. Yes. Um, as of today, Friday. Basically like the Banu seasonal stuff. Yeah. Whose seasons have passed. Yeah. <laughs> Basically they're um, on sale. They won't be on sale for long. They will have at this point yeah. been on sale all week long. Yeah, because we don't but, have a huge uh, quantity of them, but we are, you know, because the seasons have passed, we were like, okay, well. Yeah. So but check it out. See, yeah. if it's, see, if, see if it's still on sale. Awesome. All right, Drew, what do you got? Speaking of Benu, Brian. Yeah. Um, we've got a new Benu adding <sighs> to our refreshment collection. Another exclusive that we're all very excited about. Neapolitan. Yeah. Which is obviously modeled after Neapolitan ice cream, vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate all coming together, having a blast, having a great party in your hand as you write with the delightful new Benu pen. Now, Drew. Yes. What order of colors do you think is officially Neapolitan. You because know what? there is debate. It's it's going to be shocking to you because normally this is something I would care very much about. I do not care it at all. It seems like you should care I, about this should. a lot. I could not care less about this. You had the opinion here. You When we were discussing this Because we, we had to figure this out when we made this pen. I, I came up with the idea and then they sent me a bunch of different options and then I showed you and Rachel all the options and you said to me, I feel strongly that strawberry should be in the middle. Is that what I said? Yes. I don't remember what No, 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 no. You said you feel strongly that vanilla, vanilla should, be, should be in the middle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because that's, that's the pen. You were like the most opinionated one. I don't think anybody else cared that Not much. Not really, but you were like vanilla needs to be in the middle. And yeah. I agreed because it's more fun to look at strawberry and chocolate. So that's what we did. Yeah, you know what it is? I think part of it is Tell like me. we were a big ice cream sandwich family. Oh. Because partly is portion control. Because mm -hmm. um, my kids otherwise will just scoop like half the a container into a coffee mug and be like, oh, I got ice cream. And I'm like... What's, how many servings is that, please? Um, not that I'm any better, but. You can pack that. a lot into a coffee mug. I can, I can and my kids can too. They picked up on that very naturally. Um, but no, so we buy ice cream sandwiches. You can get Neapolitan ice cream sandwiches, which are awesome. Mm -hmm. But it's always chocolate, vanilla, strawberry. Mm -hmm. So at least in my mind, from having eaten not an insignificant number of these things in recent years, that's just what sticks out in my mind. But I feel good about that. We looked up pictures of it online and it is mixed. Like, I don't think chocolate is often in the middle. Mm. I think chocolate's pretty consistently on the edge, but as to which one, strawberry and vanilla, is totally up for debate. So I don't know. If y'all have opinions about it, let me know. But the way the pen looked, no one else cared as much. I cared, I guess, a little bit more. I think it looks great. And nobody else really wanted to fight it. I so think the that's balance, what we ended up with. <laughs> the balance, I, I, my only thing is I wanted chocolate to be the barrel because that, yeah, the, that the, the, the chocolate acrylic that Benu is using for this pen is very satiny, has a nice mm. wave to it. Yeah. And I feel like that needed to be showcased, you know, in a greater uh, yeah. uh, ratio. Yeah, makes um, sense. Man, it is really coming down. It's pouring rain right now. Yeah, we they can actually, hear it. They, they like close our schools a couple hours early today because the weather's going to get so gnarly. So yeah. I'm sure you guys can't hear it because the limiters are pretty good and noise, noise reduction is pretty yeah. good on our microphones. But if we are looking up every now and then, like something crazy is going on, it's because there's crazy weather. A lot of team happening. members have gone home, but yeah. Brian and I know we are We're here dedicated. for you. Yes. We don't care if we have to sleep in here. We don't care. We are well, pen casting it. Brian doesn't care at all if he has to sleep uh, here. I have, totally fine. I have had to sleep at the office before. That's right. And the cops showed up. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That happened. <laughs> There's a long story there, but I'll, we'll just tease that out and I'll see if it comes back up mm. later in the episode. Um, um, all right. And then. Uh, I'm really not trying to break two hours and. <laughs> 36 right. minutes Ferris wheel press. Let's do it. Ferris wheel press, radiant, ro <clears throat> radiant <laughs> rose wing, radiant rose wing, 20 mil bottle. So that means it's a fairy tales collection. So Ferris wheel press, radiant mm -hmm. rose wing is a rose pink ink with duochrome gold pink shimmer. So it's mm. a lighter pink, mm. not going to really pop and explode off your page, but it's subtle, it's fancy, and it's sparkly. Yeah. Additionally, by this time, we will have launched the Retro 51 Popper Day and Night, hey which has a nice gradient to it. Gradients from kind of a blue to a yellow with a nice kind of nature scape surrounding the pen. Mm -hmm. It's a fun, very bright pen or very dark pen, depending on kind of your mood. You can just kind of make it be whatever you want it to be, or it can just represent that nice balance between the dichotomy of your soul. So enjoy that. It's available now. I think, hopefully, unless it sells out by Friday, which I don't think it will. You should be okay. We never know with poppers. Nope, we never know. We never know what's going to happen. I don't even know how many we got in, so that also depends greatly <laughs> on it. So we'll see. What, what do we know? We don't I, know I know it came in. I know it came okay. in. It arrived. It I exists. saw it. I saw it today. Yep. 
There we go. go it exists it in this building at this moment. That's I can say. Boom. We can also say, time for Q and A. All right. All right. I, think, I feel like we paused three or four seconds on that one. Drew. That was a good long one. That yeah. was a good healthy <clears throat> pause. Yeah. All right. I was, hey, the, I was debating hey. in my mind, like, should I say anything? And I was like, no, I'm just nah. gonna, I'm just gonna let it be. I'm just gonna linger yeah. in the awkwardness. Okay. All right, Brian. A this Q <laughs> from Alan. Oh yeah. This is right up your alley. It is. Alan asks, I was gifted a wood turned pen for Christmas this year. That okay. is just gorgeous. Awesome. The medium nib was quite a bit too much for me. So I measured the feed and found it to be six millimeters wide. Well, there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I ordered an extra fine number six nib from Goulet and it works wonderfully. Cool. But I was wondering if I end up using this pen as much as I think I might, are there good options to place a gold nib into it? I'm a bit of a gold nib snob, Sailor mm. Pro Gear, Pilot mm -hmm. A23, Lamy 2000. Okay. Finally, do you have any pet tips for long-term maintenance of wooden pens. I've heard that some people use Renaissance wax to keep them looking good and prevent them from cracking or absorbing ink from your fingers when filling them. So Brian okay. got a two-parter. Yeah. Should this person get a gold nib? Hmm. And how should this person take care of their wood pen? So this was like deep dive teasing territory here, but I didn't take the bait. Whoa. So we're just gonna hit on it and move on. My goodness. Because um, honestly, anytime you start talking about details of nibs, you can dive pretty deep anywhere that you want or to. wood or wood i'm sure different types of wood need to be yes. maintained differently especially with me like just it doesn't take much no it doesn't um so i will say as far as the nibs go in my experience with pen kits so for those of you that don't know you don't know anything about that if this is your first pen cast and you know nothing about our background i started out as a pen maker like a pen kit guy doing this and then it slowly turned into this over a series of events that I'll skip over. Uh, but I have some experience with pen kits. I have not kept up with the pen kit offerings all that much in the last 14, 15 years. Um, but I, I get some catalogs every now and then from good old Penn State Industries or, you know, Craft Supplies USA, some of my old stomping grounds. Um, but uh, yeah, so a lot of pen kits seem the same. Basically, all the pen kits had either a number five or a number six nib. Seemed like pretty standard nibs they were not great nibs they were okay but no name brand you know iridium point germany that kind of a thing classic who knows who made them kind of a thing um but you know basically they were not that not amazing but you they were basically swappable with like a yovo or a bach number five and number six um other brands like you mentioned sailor pilot lamy those are all proprietary none of them are going to fit other pens, no pen kits, any of that kind of stuff. So you, you're pretty much looking Bach or Yovo. Um, now I will say we don't have a lot of spare nibs. We do have some, like we have our number six and number five Goulet nibs. So those would fit. Um, there's some other ones like Mana Verde and Conklin would fit into a pen kit. Um, what else would fit? Edison would fit. Um, yeah, and, and, and then I'm trying to think, That's all. I think that's all the spare nibs that we have that would probably fit. You could probably yank the nib off of a Twisby VAC 700 nib unit and put that on if you really wanted to, but there's no reason because you're buying the whole grip section on that one. Um, but anyway, if you want a gold nib though, we don't have any spare number six or number five mm -hmm. gold nibs for that matter. Um, part of the reason is because they're really expensive and there's not that many people that are swapping out gold nibs to upgrade them on their number six pens. And they're out there though. Frankly, most people who have experienced the steel nib and the gold nib version would tell you that it's frankly not worth it. That's up for debate. It is, but, but if you're a gold nib snob, I, I would say you would probably appreciate I it. I have heard that even- They're for, good nibs. Like Yobo, they are. Yobo especially like, I don't, I have less experience with the Bach but, know, standard number six But for nibs. $130, like I've- Is met, that worth it? That's gonna be up to the- It is. The I've heard many people say the opposite. Like, no, it's not worth it. I've even people who even- Most people would say that, yes. Yes, even, you know, people who make pens have said that to me. But if you have like, I'm assuming if this pen was like a Christmas gift, there's sentiment to it. Mm -hmm. So if you want, if you're like truly gold nib snob and you're like, I run a really nice writing gold nib pen, but it has to be on this pen, really your only option is to buy that, you know, gold nib and put it on there, which I would say it's a premium that you're paying for it, but it's going to be a nice writing nib. Like those are nice writing nibs. Yeah. Um, so you would probably find it worth it. It'll be better. Just maybe not $130 better. It's totally up to you. 
depends what the $130 means in your life. But um, yeah, so I would say that, that that would probably work. That saying, that said, I'm going off the assumption here that the number six nib that you already have already fits and works in there. No, I don't know all pen kits. Don't assume that any like handmade kit pen that you buy would fit one of these. You're going to have to like basically ask the person that made them um, what would fit it. They probably won't know because most pen makers have known nothing about nibs, including myself until I got into it, um, which I won't get into that whole story because most of you all know that. Anyway, um, second part, caring for wood, wood pens. Um, so a lot of this, I would say it's going to depend on what wood and what finish was applied to your handmade pen given the like craft pen world it can vary so much um even the stability of that wood and all that kind of stuff now there are not a lot of commercial pen companies making pens out of wood when they are it's usually kind of a special or a limited thing like pilot for their 50th anniversary of the vanishing point they did a wood pen but it was a very boring straight grained very clear wood Nothing crazy going on there. Mainly, probably, I would assume, for stability's purposes. I want to say they did a wood pen this year or last year. They... Like it might have been a Japan only thing, but I want to say I saw a wood VP so? really? recently. Yeah, maybe I'm maybe I'm lying. I don't recall seeing that. It's possible. I don't keep up with everything. Keep going. Um, there's other pens. Faber Castell has done mm-hmm. a lot of wood pens. They did some of that for like Pernambuco and some other things like that. Um, we've definitely had some wood pens from Conklin. Uh, come out several times. Monteverde's done some wood on their regattas and stuff like that. Um, so it's definitely, it definitely can be done, but the challenge with any wood is that wood is not the most stable of materials in any situation. Like usually when you're dealing with wood furniture, you are building the furniture with expansion and movement in mind. So there's techniques and ways that you do it because wood basically, it's a, it's a cellulosic material. It's going to you know, shrink in the winter time. Usually when it's drier, it's going to swell more in more of the rainy season, the humid season. And that movement can cause issues if it's made it up against something that is not movable. So when you have a situation like you have a wood on a pen and you've got a metal barrel inside that pen and wood on the outside, if you get a lot of expansion and contraction and certain woods have more kind of movement and less stability to them, just inherently based on the type of tree that it came from, certain woods are just prone to cracking more. Um, so I will say like, if you're dealing with a handmade pen, a lot of it's gonna come down to what is that wood and what season even might it have been made in, you know? Cause if you're making it in the, say the winter time and it's really, really dry and then you get around to the summertime and it swells on there, but the metal is not swelling cause it's not absorbing moisture you could deal with some cracking and stuff. That was one of the biggest pains in the butts that I had. I love wood and I loved making wood pens, but my biggest frustration was the factors I couldn't control with the stability of woods and stuff. So there's a lot of really beautiful woods that look nice on pens, but some of them are just so prone to cracking that it's almost impossible to avoid no matter what finish you put on it. So I don't know if you're gonna run into that, hopefully not, but just know that any like kit craft pen that you're dealing with, there is always a risk of that. And if you're, especially if you're dealing with somebody who like does it part-time or doesn't like really do it as like a career, like craftsman type thing, they may not know the long-term stability of a given wood. I know I didn't when I was first starting out. I so I had to learn over time that like, oh yeah, certain pins that I made, like- They all exploded. Have all started cracking a bunch, you know? So that's a thing. And those are all the ones that I ended up keeping. Like <laughs> I sold every pen that I possibly could because I was so flat broke at the time. But any pen that would like get a crack in it, I'd be like, well, can't sell this one. And now that's like literally almost all I have left. I have like one or two pens that aren't like cracked or somehow damaged. Um, So that's the thing. Best thing to do is to ask the maker, whoever made it or whoever gifted you the pen, see if you can find out where they got it. So you can ask more directly to the source. They will have the best information as to what the wood was and what finish that they applied to it because the finish can vary quite a lot too. Um, I will say a common finish if it's a really glossy finish on a kit pen like that um uh cyanoacrylate glue uh super glue what did you just say cyanoacrylate cyano cyanoacrylate cyanoacrylate yeah super glue that's what super glue is okay um it's basically just like a it's like a it's it's basically acrylic melted in acetone so that's that's basically what super glue is you think that's the finish yeah that's, I mean, it could be. Oh, wow. If it's a really, really glossy kind of plasticky finish on the wood, it's probably going to be 
CA glue, as it's known in the, the world. I made really? A lot they of finish things. it with super glue? Yeah, yeah. So you basically, you kind of turn on the lathe really slow. You drip the super glue on. You kind of like rub it smooth out a little bit, and then you kind of sand it down. You can polish it up, and it's basically, by the time the solvent evaporates, you have acrylic. You have a like acrylic. It's the same stuff like with nail polish. That's what nail polish is. It has acetone in it. So when you put on, you know, it's basically basically super glue in so many words, that's kind of what nail polish is. Hmm. So it's not unlike applying nail polish, you're sort of applying that to the wood surface and it seals it, protects it pretty well. Um, yeah, so that could be it. Does acetone remove um, super glue? Yes. I didn't know that. It'll, well, it, not as smoothly as it will with um, like nail polish, right. but yeah, it'll it'll definitely like melt it down and, and all that kind of stuff. Like, Remushify yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. How about that? It, it's not like super clean, but it'll like, soften it up and you can sort of remove it and stuff like that yeah fascinating yeah and then you yeah cyan cyanoacrylate that's the, the word. uh the pen i was thinking of was a brown pen that was a Jap japan only okay but it was not wood it was light brown to dark brown gradient oh. which is stunningly beautiful but okay. it, they called it the whiskey but with no h oh interesting yeah it was a Japanese. okay i i I, I, had, I had it in my mind but it wasn't okay okay cool <clears throat> um yeah so anyway wood so if you have one of those kit pens that's got that CA glue on it, you don't need to do anything to that finish to maintain it because it's, it's basically plastic at that point. Just don't put acetone on it. Don't put acetone on it. Yeah, I was going to say, any any wood pen, you don't want to clean it with any type of chemicals, really, at all. Use, like, water and, like, a microfiber cloth to clean it at most. Maybe, like, a dish soap or something really, really mild. But don't use, like, even, like, furniture polish or any of that. Type. Like, don't use anything with chemicals. No Windex, none of that kind of stuff. So it's just going to, it might patina a little bit over time. If you don't have like a super thick film finish on it, like a CA glue would be, you know, if it's just something that's like a, you know, mineral oil or, you know, something like that. Um, and then you have like more of the raw, like feel of the wood that's on there. There's so many different types of wood finishes. I, I don't want to deep dive into that. I have no idea what it could be on this pen, but, you know, basically you asked about Renaissance wax or Ren wax as it's known in the pen circles, pen making circles. Um, Renaissance wax is great. I actually have, I have a jar of that that I used to finish a lot of wood pens back in the day. And it's in your backpack right now. I didn't bring it, no. <laughs> uh, but it looks the same. They have not changed the design on that in like 30 years. Um, but I think I've used maybe a third of that jar and I've had it for like 15 years and it still works great. Um, but that stuff is very mild. I think they use it a lot for like, you know, antiques and stuff like that. It's pretty safe stuff to use. Um, it wouldn't necessarily hurt to put that on your pen, probably, um, because it's the stuff is so mild. Uh, but yeah, it's um, you just want to make sure that the pen was clean. You don't want to like put wax on top of just grodiness. Um, so yeah, that is stuff. But that's that's not going to help keep it from cracking. If the wood's going to crack, it's going to crack because it's absorbing moisture in the air. Um, if you drop it or you do something crazy, you know, you don't want to soak the pen in water. Basically you want to try to keep it dry. Um, so yeah. And then, you know, as far as like ink getting on the wood, yeah, that's like the biggest downside to having wood pens is you're with fountain pens, you're dipping them in ink and you might get ink on your fingers and then you touch the pen and now there's ink on the wood. That kind of sucks, but that's just kind of how it is. It's why wood's not maybe the best and most popular material for pens, which is why I'm not making pens anymore myself. But anyway, they do look cool. You just have to be conscious of that. Um, the wax might help a little bit with some extra like water repulsion, re repellence, repellence, repulsion, repulsion. Propulsions. Propul pr <laughs> why am I asking you? <laughs> anyway, so yeah. But if you got some Renaissance wax, throw it on there. Probably won't hurt anything. That's all I got. I call it Ren wax. Well, then you're yeah. you're in the know. Yeah. Penturners.org, I believe, is the the forum that it literally has not changed like how it looks at all since I was on it like 15 years ago. Nice. I think I'm actually on there as Goulet Pens, if I'm not mistaken. I got like 1,400 posts on there from back in the day. Dang. I was legit at the time. Anyway, a little fun thing. Anyway, I'm done. <laughs> Next question for Drew. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, from I, C I, So I... I know this is a long one. I, bo I bolded is. the things that I think you need to paraphrase it should you wish to paraphrase. We got time. Okay. I think we're good. All right. All right. Dub 92 says in so many words, I got a question for the pen cast. Do you have any quirks, kind of like the Drew's three pen rule, that are they're irritating, but just to yourself? First one is if I only ink up cartridge converter pens with inks 
no, sorry, first one is that, so C-dub here, will only ink up a cartridge converter pen with inks that are available in cartridge form uh, because it bugs them not to have a backup cartridge. So they don't wanna be caught with something filled in a converter that they can't then stick a cartridge in if they need to. Um, they have no problem with a vacuum piston eyedropper. They don't even think about it. But for cartridge pens, they gotta, they gotta have that backup. Um, stinks because they love the Lamy Ion. Another one is matching inks to pens. I have no problem throwing a black ink into pretty much anything or putting anything into a demonstrator or plain back black or silver pen, but I can't force myself to putting something that clashes with the pen color, like a green ink into a purple pen or something like that. It just makes my brain itch. Drew? You gotta have some quirks. I have, you gotta I have, have some quirks. I have a couple right? quirks. I mean, obviously, there's the I do have a three pen rule. I will never ever ink up more than three pens at one time. I just don't do that because I hate cleaning pens, and I'm 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 fine at it. I can go quickly and thoroughly. I, I know what to do and how to do it after all this time. <laughs> Still don't like it. Still don't like it. Still mm -hmm. hate it. It's the least fun experience. You know, least fun thing to do with the fountain fountain pen experience. Mm. So three, is that is that irritating to yourself though? Like your three pen rule? No, I I. I will seek out and enjoy moderation wherever I can find it in my life. I value it greatly. Okay. Um, keeps me sane. See, with me, though, if you are if you have a three-pin rule and you're just changing it out with colors, you're just cleaning them more frequently. You are a walking cautionary tale of, I know. you know, what I'm lack of I'm moderation a... does to a human being, Brian. We'll, we'll get to mine. I get, I, we'll get to mine in a second. I am exhausted <laughs> just hearing about your lack of moderation. So it just, you, you are, you constantly yeah. reaffirm my way of life of <laughs> laziness and sedentary behavior. Well, hey. So sometimes um, you learn more from <laughs> what not to do. Than from no, what to no, do, you're right? definitely leading a more, <laughs> more full life. But anyway, um, yeah, so I've got that. I only keep three pins inked up at one time. And now I will say that I generally do clean them all and reset them all at the same time. Oh, okay. Uh, when one runs out, that's kind of like my cue. Like, all right. Just clear all three. All three, yep. That's good. Yep. That's good. I could see that making sense because cleaning three pens. I find is about my limit to yeah. like what I can easily do in like one sitting. Yeah. And I don't want to like, especially I would if it's rather, not crusty and stuff. You I would know? rather clean three pens at once than clean one pen every week. Like all the time. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I don't do that. So yeah. that's, that's one. Well, if but you I, like that strategy, Drew, you could clean like 40 pens, like once every six months. <laughs> Another thing that I do, a quirk or rule that I have in place is that I don't ink up the same pen twice and not in a row. Um, oh, and I also don't okay. use the same ink twice in a row. So okay. Okay. I've got Christmas pudding here from last year. Um, uh, I've got um, Diamond Winter Spice in this. Mm. If I finish this, this is going into storage and Winter Spice will not be inked up in any of my three next pens. You know, if you ink it up with the <clears throat> same ink, you don't have to clean it. I have That's a little more, life hack I love all my pens though. So I like, <laughs> I love the variety. I love switching it up. Mm. And if like right now I've got- It's like a byproduct of your three pen limitation here. Yeah. So right now I've got okay. one sailor and two pilots inked up. Okay. My next round, I will probably have one Japanese pen in, in there because I just, okay. I want to, I don't want to do more of the same. Because otherwise I'd be using pilots all the time. Let's be honest. Um, so I mix it up because then I find myself enjoying things that I, you know, I want to make sure everything gets a shot, yeah, gets a chance. That makes sense. Um, so yeah, I don't ink up pens twice in a row or in use inks twice in a row. Okay. I will but, also. But Drew, is this irritating to yourself? I feel like this was an important part of the question. Um, these are just like good, good rules for yourself. I can't, well, like my, my pen rule doesn't irritate myself. Yeah. So like, uh. I don't know that are just irritating to yourself. Yeah. Like things so, that things that you sort of compulsively do that you kind of wish you didn't, but no, you No, I don't have any of those. It. Really? I do everything completely intentionally. Wow. Yeah. I have a lot of quirks. So I'll, I'll yeah. get to share some of that for yeah, this no, question. No, none of mine I dislike. Mine, my, like all of mine are to avoid things I dislike. <laughs> yeah, that makes like, sense. I, I, I do these things because um, like I will also say I only use refillable cartridges for my pilot pens. I don't deal with the Con 40 mm. or the Con uh, 70. I'm like, no, forget it. So I refill cartridges. That doesn't bother me. What bothers me are the converters. Mm. So. But that's not a quirk that's irritating No, to I'm yourself. happy to have my quirk. My quirk stops me from being bothered. Interesting, okay. And then I also don't use off-season pens. I guess this could probably be the thing that bothers me the most. Yeah. Is that yeah. I love the Christmas pudding, Sailor, Pro Gear, Slim. Yeah. But it's Christmas pudding. 
I can't use it. Like once I exhaust this ink, it's going to be put away until next year. Okay. So I guess that is a little irritating to myself. I wish I could. Why? You don't have to wait. You can use it anytime. <sighs> it's not seasonal, Brian. So? It'll be spring before you know it. Yeah? It's not time for this. And likewise. Drew, you know we're selling the Monograppa Elmo Beach and it's like crappy cold weather it outside. It is. I, Sometimes I, it's nice to go off season because yeah. like when it's in the heat and you got the bugs and everything, you're like, boy, just think about when it's cold and you get snuggle up Perhaps. and have a cocoa or tea or something like that. Perhaps. You can like relive that in the middle of the But also of the absence makes the heart grow fonder. You don't know how excited I was to break this bad boy out again. This oh, made me very happy. Said for it's that. like, it's pudding time. Somebody said for that. And then likewise. It's like my, the sweaters. It's like the sweaters. Yes, exactly. Those sweaters sit up in my, like way up in my closet for most of the year. And then when in, it's time. I keep mine in one of those like thin out. little plastic things with wheels on that goes under the bed. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, so likewise, my Sailor Pro Gear Slim Monyo Nuts pen, I feel, is more of a fall pen um, with the acorn vibe and everything like sure, that. So sure. that'll be that'll be chilling until the you know late summer slash fall, I think. Um, not going to have it. I don't have a strict rule, but I do have a uh, proclivity. I have a fun fact. I don't know if I've shared it on the pen cast before about acorns. Okay. Do you remember me sharing anything about acorns with you? I don't remember anything about any pen cast. Shoot. Okay. It's all a blur for me. I'll save it. And obviously Retro 51 comes out with a bunch of seasonal pens as well. So I have a little yeah. uh, pen cube on my desk. Right now they still have all the Christmas pens in them, but mm. they'll come out. I'll put my regular Retro 51s in there. Okay. And they'll stay there all year until well, Halloween comes around and then... I'll put my, you know, bump in the night in there and I'll put my sleepy hollow in there and yeah, anyway. So I'm really, really curious. Like I know we're talking about a whole bunch of things here that I know everybody's gonna have their own opinions about. Please like, if you don't comment a lot, like comment down about these things that we're talking about right yeah. now. Cause I'm really curious like how like, things like the matching the ink to the pen. I know that's a big one, but like the seasonal pen thing, like, I am one of those, I, I will use any pen, any season. If I want to use it, I'm going to use it. I don't care what time of year. I mean, if I really want to, I'm not going to no. stop myself. It's not like a hardcore thing, but I have a I have an aversion to it. It's not even a thought for me. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a thought for like, me. Doesn't even... Like matching is also a thought for me. Okay. Like this will never have, like I've got red in the finial, green in the cap, brown in the barrel. Mm. Those are three great colors. I will never need to put yeah. anything other than red, green, and brown in this. Okay, so that's where you, because I was going to ask about that with you representing C-Dub and probably a lot of other people, yeah. those who like really feel compulsed to match the ink to the pen. So if you have a pen like that, that's multicolored, like maybe multicolored sections, or if it's like a pen that's got a swirl yeah. or maybe a flake that's got different colors, you'll work within the color scheme of whatever that material Definitely. is. Definitely, yeah. But not stray from that. Not usually. Okay. I mean, okay. I'm sure I have at some point, but uh, it's helpful to me because but if you had the option, you would, you would match. If I had two pens already inked up, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh yeah, I want to use Christmas pudding, but I don't have an ink for it, and I'm like, oh my god, this new ink, it just came out, and I haven't inked it up yet. It's on my desk. Then I'm like, oh yeah, sure, I'll ink it up. Yeah, like, it's like an orange or something. I mean, because I mean, I I want to use this. I'm not going to go searching for an orange just because. But okay, so okay, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, uh, deny myself. Okay. But uh, it is it definitely helps me make decisions about what I'm going to ink, ink up. Interesting. So for, yeah. it's it's a helpful it's a tool for me. It's not a uh, okay. it's not an irritating quirk. I, I I use it to bring sanity to my hobby. So I have a I'm I'm really curious. I have no data to speak of, but I guess I have a, th a th hypothesis okay. here. So you know, I mean, we have some data to know that like demonstrator pens. And basically black pens are always the most popular selling color of pretty much whatever. Ah. I wonder how much of that is influenced by this compulsion to match the color of the ink to the pen and the freedom that one might feel with a black or a demonstrator pen if that's why it's more popular. I don't think that's a crazy thought because blue is- It's a blue, factor. Blue's always like the- other mo blue is always the most popular, like regular color. Well, blue is, is the most popular color of ink too. Blue is like, at least in the U.S., blue is like America's favorite color. Yeah. Like when all the polls and stuff like that, which people's favorite color, it's always blue. Yeah. 
So it's like, why is blue not the most popular pen color? I bet it's because most people don't want to feel restricted to using yeah. blue ink. But the, the, but it's also like one of really the, always one of their top colors too. Yes, and we there have more, a big range, and we have more blue ink like than that. any other color. Yeah, I'm really curious about this. Please let me know in the comments if you feel like I'm on the right track. I think I think, I think you're on the right track. I think that there is not an insignificant factor here. There's some with like ink freedom with these like there's some more neutral colored pens yeah yeah anyway. definitely some correlation yeah. what about you what are your quirks all right so mine you know like you've got rules in place that are enhancing your use of your pens either that or i'm just stubbornly you know beholden to them but either, either way i'm fine with it well that you you could say principled instead there we go. of stubborn sure um you know so you you create rules to benefit your life and i said I, I like to make rules so that I can break them. That sounds like you. You know, I create a calendar and then I will be late to my own meetings and I will bump and move things. I don't, you have, we, we've I don't talked like, about how you're devil's advocate to yourself. I don't like authority, times. even my own authority <laughs> for myself. It's, it's a problem sometimes. Mm. Um, I long ago gave up holding myself to any particular type of system because I've tried to not like really, really, really tried, but I've taken attempts at like, I'm gonna ink a couple of pens and I'm gonna keep a card that has the ink on it and all this. Like, I'm gonna try to be all organized. And I look at that and I'm like, that to me is inspirational, but I will, am never gonna be able to keep up with doing that because it's just not the way that my brain works, unfortunately. It is a better system. My life would be easier if I managed it like that, but I don't and I've kind of given up trying because it's just, so unnatural to me. See, for me, it helps me because <clears throat> I get to really focus on enjoying these three pens. If I had a bunch mm -hmm. of them inked up, I would use a bunch of them and I'd love them all, Yeah, but I wouldn't get to really connect with them. And, I get that. I get that. And I, I feel like I have a, a greater connection when I have just the three and I go between the three. I get that. I really do. And maybe some of it is like my, I, I've like, Oh, you got, Analogy, you got Brian. Fun. Oh, it's a part. It's a party. When you go to a party with a bunch of friends, okay, it's great being at the party. You love everybody there. Okay, it's it's delightful. Unless you're like me, in which case you get tired after 20 minutes. Sure. But still, you got your friends. You hooray! Got, you're in party. good company here with this crowd. But 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 you don't really get to connect with anybody. You know, you mm. you're running around. You want to say hi to everybody. You know, it's just wild and crazy. But then you go out to dinner. And you sit down at a booth mm. with three other people. Hmm. You being the fourth, two on that side, two on that side. That is connection. That is when you have those good conversations. That's okay. when you have, you get to find out what's going on in their lives. How's your family? How's the kids? So you're talking like a, like a, a friend dinner or like yeah. a board game night or something like yeah. that, as opposed to like a party. That's right. A bunch okay. of pins inked up, that's a party. And that's great. A lot of people love parties. Mm -hmm. I prefer the dinner. I prefer okay. having okay. a nice meal with friends. Yeah. Having a nice conversation. Okay. Taking our time. I get it. You're not wrong. Not, not, I, I, I get it. The three pin system is a cozy dinner. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so here's some of my quirks. I will often ink up several pens in very similar colors of ink, usually of the blue persuasion. Mm -hmm. And I will often get confused as to which ink that I've put into those pens. And... Uh, if I need to be precise about what color was in there, I will then have to like clean it out and then re-ink it, you know? So I don't want you all to be misunderstood. Don't feel like you can't rely on me for the things that matter. I will, Drew knows I will spend way more time and energy preparing for something that I know I need to be like an expert or like where I'm talking like this, despite how it may come across in the pencast. I'm actually yeah, usually pretty prepared. Well, last but, last week I was supposed to shoot three videos. He was going to do three. He only did two because he was he did not have enough time to research what he wanted to research because he yeah. held, he holds I'm, a very very high standard for himself. Bar. I don't. I don't. Yeah. I will. I don't have no standards for the content I produce yeah. for you. But I'm a little more like kind of all or nothing. So yes, one hundred percent. If I if I know it's it's like a hyper focus thing. If I know that I need to like write with a pen to like really absorb it and really experience and all that, I will do that in like a shorter, more dedicated period of time. Well, you're also more in Brian work mode at that point because you, I am, you, yeah. you, you feel yeah. like you have a responsibility. Yes. But when you're using pens casually, yeah. it's just you. It's I'm, not, I'm usually not 
at the forefront thinking about right. the pen and that experience. I'm right. thinking about whatever it is that I'm thinking about, and the pen is more of a tool. Um, so I kind of have two different modes that I'm in. Mm -hmm. And this might be more unique to just my circumstance because I'm like trying to learn and be an expert and gain that experience. So I will absolutely like be all in in those times, but I can't do that all the time every time I pick up a pen, you know, because oftentimes if I'm getting together with a friend or a business associate and I'm trying to pay attention to them and I'm writing down some notes here and there, I'm really not fully focused on the pen uh, experience that I'm having. I just want a good experience. So I have a few like go-to standby pens that I'll keep for those purposes. Um, so for me, I'm much more like changing pens out and I keep a bunch inked up all the time and I kind of have some to grab. I keep some in my backpack. I keep some in my desk. I have some in the office. I have some in the car. I have some in my workshop. It's like there's kind of pens everywhere. Um, and I will just ink up and change them out, you know, more often. Um, so not every pen that I'm using in my life is like for the purpose of like cataloging it and making sure I had that that experience. But then again, you know, this transcends like basically my whole kind of life, not just the time I have in the office here. So um, if I were more diligent about managing which inks that I kept and which pens, that would make my life easier. But a quirk about me is I don't do that. And I also have a propensity to like the same colors over and over again, blues. And I have like 40 blues and I'll ink up and I'll be like, oh, I haven't tried Konagi in a while. Or let me, no, let's do Konpeki again in this one. And I'm like, oh crap, these two colors are really similar. Which one did I put in which pen? I'm like, ah, I don't know. Does it really matter most of the time? No, because they're both really pleasing blues. But if it's like, we're getting ready to shoot a video or I'm trying to do something, I'm like, I don't remember which ink is in this pen. And if it matters, then I will have to go and like clean it up. Or, or usually what I'll do is I'll just go ink another pen for that video or for that purpose of, you know, showing it. And now I've got multiple pens and another that I've added that probably has one of the same inks in it. So this is why I have so many pen cleaning problems. Um, but anyway, it's not prohibitive in my life. I just ink up a lot of pens. Um, okay, another one for me. Um, on pens like Lamy's, for example, that have swappable nibs or like very similar components, I am switching that crap around all the time. Or I might pull nibs off to have as like spare nibs and other things like that. So there's probably a few safaris and all-stars and stuff that I have in my drawer that don't even have nibs on them. Oh, yes. Or that are missing converters and all this kind of, you know, because you've had to pull I'm, stuff. Yeah. So you have to be careful. Are so you, many missing nibs. Or you pull something and you're like, that doesn't have a gold nib on it. Why does this all-star have a gold nib? That's because yeah. I swapped it for something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yes. So I do have to double check myself because I don't keep everything in like, pristine as it came out of the box thing for the pens in my collection. I have to like, there's a little bit of swapping around on yeah. some parts and things. So, and this is not, this is less of like, you know, a me management thing, but I have a lot of historical pens. So it's like when there's a design change on something that's happened a while ago, if it's a really important pen, I'll actually get the new one and then I'll keep the old one, like back when it was the Namiki Falcon instead of the Pilot Falcon. Well, I have both, but when we go to like shoot a video or talk about it or showing a team member about it, we got to make sure we're grabbing the right one. So if a team member is like just coming in and trying to grab a pen, I have to like disclaim and be like, which pen are you looking for? Because there's historical variations of things that are hard to tell all up in that collection. So that's a thing that you just have to kind of watch out for. I don't know how I would like, I don't know, put a little tag on it or kind of catalog it. I have it all cataloged in my spreadsheet that I keep for all my pens, but like physically the pens, I would have to like tag them or keep something on them to note all that. And it's just like, it's too much to write down. So I don't. So you you kind of have to know what you're getting into when you get in there. So that's a little thing, I guess. Um, and then the last thing is I wait way too long to clean most of my pens. I've talked about that. Um, but I need to reference them a lot. And I don't often clean my pens at the office because you got to understand, like as a business owner, my whole life is managing my family, my business, my everything. And it's not like I think about the business from eight to five and then I don't think about it. It's all flowing throughout. So not until, in terms of not like, until you uh, do severance, right? Right. Exactly. Just, just come in as a different version of Brian every exactly. day. Exactly. I wouldn't want to sever. Why would I want to? Nah. Um, but what that means for me is like wherever I am, I'm usually thinking, what's the thing that I can do uniquely like right here or right now? Like who are the people that I'm with that I need to meet with or talk through or what do I have access to here? So like when I'm at the office, am I gonna be cleaning pens 
Usually not, because that's something I can easily do at home by myself. So when I'm here at the office, I'm gonna be doing things that I can only do here or talking to people that are only here, you know, that kind of stuff. So I'm always kind of running through, that's part of why I also don't have like the strictest cleaning regimen. Cause then I get home and like the house is torn apart and I'm cleaning dishes. So then like, I'm like, whatever, the pens can wait. I got other things to worry about. So then, you know, the pens is ultimately wait. But you know, what ends up happening, this is the quirky part of it. And I literally, have, oh, I don't have my backpack with me right now, but uh, I literally have like a 12 pen case right now that's filled with pens that are in basically like really dried up or like there may be some ink left in there, still kind of usable. But basically they're pens that are like in limbo that need to be cleaned that I just haven't gotten to cleaning yet because I keep bringing them home to clean at home, but then I don't, so then I bring them back. So I'm basically carting around a bunch of pens that need to be cleaned kind of all the time. We also <laughs> may have learned today that the horns that we used on our New Year's episode might still be in his backpack. Yeah, I don't know for sure. He was going to bring I, him home to the kids, but he's like, where'd those go? <laughs> I, I like, don't remember. I you didn't, took I didn't them, pull, Brian? I didn't pull them back out. They're probably still We there. put them, I, I, I think I had <laughs> another bag. I genuinely don't know where those things are. <laughs> I feel like I would know if they were in my backpack, but no, I don't think they're in my backpack. There were some surprises in the backpack when we did yeah, your own packing. There could, be. there could be. I don't think it's in there, though. Okay. Anyway, anyway so I end up <laughs> carting around pens back and forth because... I'm trying to optimize the time where they are and the pens often will just fall a little lower on the priority list because I live a full life, like you've mentioned, Drew. There we go. So yeah, those are my quirks. Nothing too crazy. No, nah, nothing wild. Definitely things that I, you know, it's the kind of thing that you like laugh at yourself about. Yeah. And then I just- I was going to say that maybe my pen organization isn't that good, but everything's pretty together. They're just spread out across- it's got a bunch like, of different cases. Yeah. Right? yeah. But like I, don't, I have all of my, my brands together. Mm. As best I can. I just need a bigger pen case. You know when you know what the the final catalyst was for me because I was the same way. I had a bunch of different pen cases, mm -hmm. but this is when we were in the old space. I remember. I, I remember your drawer. I had like a it was, it was yes. like a hanging file folder drawer, but yeah. you just had it stacked full of like fifteen different yeah. Aston cases. Well, first off, to try to find anything was chaos yeah. because th there's all these different cases, and I was constantly switching stuff between the cases. But what happened was. <laughs> It was in like a file folder type drawer, mm -hmm. you know, like you would have hanging files. I remember. So the the sides of the drawer didn't go all the way up. Mm -mm. And what happened is one of my 40 pen cases Went slid, behind. slid off the back. I remember and that. fell behind the drawer. So the drawer still closed just fine. It stayed back there for a while. But I was, it? I was, yeah, it was like, it had been several weeks. Yes. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, <laughs> did somebody steal it? Like, did the cleaning crew take it? I like, remember what that. is happening? Oh or, my God. I was like, did I bring it home? And I was like tearing the house apart. Eventually, I, you know, recognized that I was like, oh, there's no back to that drawer. And I was like, sure enough. It was like a dark drawer and it was a black 40 pen case leaned up against the back. Of course, you wouldn't go looking for that. <sighs> anyway, that was a catalyst for me. I was like, I'm going to get a bigger container that I can't lose 40 pens at a time. It was 40? Yeah, it was a 40 pen like case. Like one of those Monteverdes? It was one of the Monteverdes. Oh, I had like okay. five or six of those at the time. Oh, that's right. And it was, it was just it was just unmanageable. It was like yeah. what you have times like five. Oh, goodness. So it was just like, I can't deal with this. Anyway, no. tangent. All, All right. right. Question time. three from Dacia. Oh, that wasn't even my question. Gosh. Okay. This will be a quick <laughs> one though. This will be a quick one. Um, Dacia asks, is there a good sealable inkwell. Mm. I like the idea of the dip pens released in the last year, but mm -hmm. I get frequently interrupted. Small children, you know how that goes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. Being yeah. able to go back to an inkwell that has not dried out would be great. I have tried ink samples, but they are small and prone to tipping. Any advice you have would be appreciated. Yeah. Um, well, I would say like anything like the, the what is it, the Dipton, um, the Sailor ones? Mm -hmm. right? That's probably what she's talking about. Yeah. So that, if you're getting that, like with the dip pen and the ink that comes with it, it comes in its own sealed bottle. So that one, but I guess it's it's like a taller, skinnier kind of bottle. Yeah. You know, usually I think if you're trying to go with dip pens, you want like a wider mouth, slightly squattier bottle. Mm. That's usually a little a little easier to work with. But I think the dipped in bottle works well for the dipped in pen. And then it's it's literally just an ink bottle that you screw the cap on. I think that works really well. Um, honestly, the best sealable ink wells are going to be ink bottles. Mm -hmm. Like we've had times in the past, not anything we've offered regularly, but we've had like promotional things like with Visconti or maybe another company that like they had like an ink well that came as like a limited edition thing with a special pen that was essentially like a, a flap that kind of went on top. But it's like, that's it's pretty, gonna evaporate. It's pretty, it's like, pretty old school. Yeah, and it's like you could, it's kind of like a giant ink miser. Like you could put some ink in there 
and like dip and stuff like that. But then it's it's not going to seal well. So after a few days, like it's going to start to dry out and it's not going to be great. Um, really like dip ink is kind of a different situation. It's made of a different material. It doesn't evaporate the same. Um, but even still, it's generally a good idea to have, you know, a sealable inkwell of any kind. Um, so by far the best, most economical, most available solution that we have, um, we're kind of uniquely suited to this as I guess any re retailer that might, you know, offer ink samples. You know, when we do ink samples, we end up with the bottles because as much as we would love to be able to buy ink in bulk in more economical containers, no one offers that, like no one. Nope. So literally when we're sampling up like tons of ink for like Emerald of Chavor or Compeki Rufus, the or ink whatever, sampling cyborg needs to open up dozens yes. of individual bottles. Our team works really hard and it's like a, it's a kind of a pain in the butt to have to constantly be opening up these little bottles and sampling out of them. But that's the process that we have to do. And that's what so we got. We end up with a bunch of spare mm. bottles. So certain brands that we have, you know, the bottles are not that great. Um, but we have some that are nicer that I would consider like basically like an inkwell that you would be willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. So basically we don't charge a lot for these things, just enough to kind of make it worth the logistical stuff and the fees and all that that we have to do to, to actually list these things. So you can get a pretty decent bottle of ink for a couple of bucks. Um, Pelican Edelstein is great. Nice wide mouth heavy bottle too, so it's not gonna tip over, all that kind of stuff. Um, very chunky cap. Uh, Pilot Hiroshizuku is great too, um, especially for dip because that, it's got even like the little cone down in the bottom of it. So as you get closer down to the bottom of that, you can get a little further down because of that little cone in the bottom. Um, the Platinum 60 mil, the reason I like those is because they will have the cone insert in them. There's a couple of inks, that and the Namiki 70 mils. Um, they will have, um, they will have those little cones in there. Uh, Twisby, 70 mils as well. The big bottles, yep. The big ones, not a lot of color option there. But again, we don't sample a ton of those, so those will be harder to find. But it's certainly a Roche Same Zuku. thing with the Namikis, those are hard to find. The Namikis are super rare, yeah. but um, the <clears throat> Platinum maybe a little bit more, but uh, definitely the Roche Zuku. We're gonna have plenty of those bottles and those are good for a dip pen. Um, the Lamy Crystal bottles too, they've got a nice wide mouth. The bottle's nice and compact, so that's a pretty decent one. Um, Private Reserve, their bottles are pretty fugly, but the opening is really, really big. So, and they, you know, would work fine for a, that kind of purpose. And um, again, we probably, the, the, we probably are, aren't gonna have as many of those though. So Roshizuku is probably gonna end up yeah. being your most, your most available one, but mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So, uh, and then of course, if you don't wanna go with like a used ink bottle, the Twisby uh, Vac or the Diamond 50 inkwell, could also work for that purpose. That's got the cone in it. Um, it's gonna have a bunch of other stuff that you don't really need for dip purposes, like the little mosquito filler thing for filling a regular pen. But I'm assuming if you're using dip pens with fountain pen ink, you're probably gonna have some fountain pens too. That's a cool bottle to have for a lot of your other pens. And you can remove that stuff. Like Twisby has, yeah, you can it's kind of like cone. a double cap system. You've got like a ring yeah. that has all the features, but then you can just take that off, set it aside and mm -hmm. use the top cap to just like make it a yeah. just a empty void. Yeah, so if you, don't need all those extra features. You're, pro I mean, it's like twenty five bucks for that thing. So yeah, you're paying. You're for paying the a features. premium, but so your more economical option will be to use or just buy a Twisby uh, and make it worth it. Well, there you go. That's the best best option of all worlds. Um, so yeah, those are my those are my thoughts, Drew. What about those, you? No, I, I agree with all those. I concur with all those. Um, mm -hmm. I would just add uh, Jacques Urban to the list, um, not the sixteen seventy, yeah, okay. the standard Jacques Urban bottles. Okay, because I they have a pretty unique feature that I think is great for a dip pen. And that oh, is a little pen rest, a little rest integrated. Yeah. And they're yeah. very squatty. So as far as yeah. stability goes, they're not gonna move anywhere. Yeah. They're not that deep. So, yeah. you know, you are gonna, you know, have mm -hmm. to deal with that, but it does have a little bit of a groove in the front of the bottle for you to rest your pen on. So if you are mm -hmm. using a dip pen regularly, you have a little place to put it with those bottles. Yeah, so solid. that's yeah. the only one I would add, but I completely agree with everything else you said. Cool. All right, there you go. All right, Drew. John asks, why do Lamy feeds, not the 2000, but other ones, have that thin piece of plastic that slides in and out of the middle of the ink channel? Could it cause clogging with pigmented or shimmering inks if not removed for cleaning? And do other pen makers use a similar type of feed? Great question. We've talked before about should we highlight the Lamy feed and that little piece that comes out and like, should we show that? It doesn't matter. Do people care? Well, obviously John cares. So now's okay. a good opportunity to mention mm -hmm. the fact that if you have a Safari, an All-Star, a Studio, an Ion, a whatever, a CP1, pretty much every Lamy pen except for a 2000, you're going to get the standard Lamy feed with the little rails that the nib slides onto. And on that feed, 
up at the top where you normally see the ink channel. Most fountain pen feeds have an ink channel in the top and an air channel in the bottom. Where you would normally see that canal for the ink to travel, you don't really see it. You see a little ridge. It's kind of covered. Yeah. But then you can take that thin, thin piece of plastic, remove it, and then your ink channel is revealed. It's hidden beneath mm. a portion of the feed. And this is, to my knowledge, the only two-part feed in modern fountain pen manufacturing. So it's a pretty unique situation. I have a, I have a caveat to that, but yes. As far as the ink channel goes, I believe that that is the case. You know another feed that comes into two pieces? Yeah. So this is a recent thing that we had. We had a little quirk with a couple of pens. This was on the uh, Pilot Custom 823s, but all the Pilot feeds are designed this way. Um, there is actually a removable piece on the Pilot feeds. Really? Yeah. On the larger ones? Um, I don't know if it's all of the feeds. Oh, the little tube in the middle. There's a little tube. Oh, that's not supposed to be removable, though. It's not supposed to, but it's it's not glued in or anything. It is a separate piece. But it needs to stay there. But this is for that. That's for the filler hole, though. That's not yeah. for the ink channel that the ink actually flows through. Yeah, no, I know what you're talking about. So it's about. kind I've, of a separate thing. I've had one of the, yeah, no, that's it's not supposed to move, though. It's not, but... But you're right. It is a like, separate piece. Like you're, you're right. It I, is. It is technically. A you're not really piece. supposed to take the Lamy feed out and remove that part either. Are you sure? Yeah, Lamy doesn't like say Did you should take it all apart. Oh, in fact, they have in the past said don't take it apart because it's way too easy to put that feedback in the wrong way, get it stuck, and break it. Gotcha. But we got some videos on that that have shown you how to do it. Well, you can remove it easily and you can put it back easily, but that is yeah. where your ink channel is. So removing that top piece, and I will show you some pictures of it removed and off and on. Um, removing that will reveal the ink channel and that is what you would want to scrub with the feed brush or something like that if you did want to give your feed a good thorough cleaning. Now, um, does any other company do this? No, no one, co no company does this. Nothing no, there. no company covers their ink channel with a second piece. That is something unique to Lamy. Mm -hmm. Why do they do that? I don't know. No I idea. actually reached out to two uh, maker friends of mine, and even they, who have feed experience, did not know for sure. Um, they suspected they that it could be that a covered ink channel might reduce the likelihood or the quickness of drying out as you know there's less of it exposed to air so if, but it's really no different than any other feed in that the roof of the ink channel is most commonly just the nib like the nib is what is acting as the roof of the ink channel in this Lamy's case the roof of the ink channel is a uh, piece of plastic that that piece of plastic touches the nib. So by adding this piece, they're hmm. almost guaranteeing a consistent width between the ink channel and whatever roof they want to create. So they're very, very strictly able to hmm. guide that ink in a very set manufactured precision based so I, tunnel. I have, a, I have a thought. Maybe it's because, you know, the nib it's it's proud of the grip. It doesn't go into the grip. So if you had an open ink channel going through way, the full way of that feed and the nib was just kind of sitting on there, you would kind of have like a gap where you would have ink channel that's coming out of the grip but it hasn't made it to the nib yet. Maybe, you know but, I mean? like, but there are other nibs that are just attached to the front too that don't have that. Yeah, like, that's what I'm not sure. You've got about. some Japanese pens that have like you know, the, and in addition to the Lamy 2000, like that that nib is just kind of stuck on the front too. Um, so mm. that might have yeah, something to do with covered, it. Yeah, but it's covered though. It's covered, you know, like for the, the nib, most part. Like Lamy part, 2000, like the hood definitely covers the nib. Like there's a lot of the nib that stays up in the. It's grip. like half. Yeah. But I'm saying like the the regular Lamy nibs are like fully exposed. Yeah, but there there are other pens like that. Like that the makes me like, curious. like like the, I, would like, have to, I would have to pull some think, pens think and about, look at some of these. Think about the platinum short gold nib. Remember that thing? Uh -huh. That's almost the same design as Lamy. Or just, even like the platinum, you know, Kiridos. Yeah, so they're both those crimped nibs mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. on the sides mm -hmm. of the rails, but those don't have any those have traditional feeds to hmm. just kind of sit know. inside of the grip. I don't know. I'm sure that there is a reason for oh, it. Oh, certainly. Because Lamy doesn't do anything no, they by accident. Don't. They certainly don't. So there's definitely engineering behind that. And I guess it's been that way for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know. So it could, it, could, it could minimize drying out. It could just be something that hmm. enables them to have manufacturing consistency in their mm -hmm. ink could flow be. channel because 
uh, they mm. make these things to be very utilitarian. They're used across yeah. the world, in, you know, just very in a very utility fashion. So yeah, maybe um, it gives them more options with like designing because they use that same nib format on basically yeah. every pen same except nib, the same 2000. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if it gives them more versatility in the design of like the grip of various pens and stuff like that. It very well might. Could be. Yep. I don't know. Maybe um, I'll, but maybe I will I'll, say like, that I I'll, have... I'll go back and ask them and see if I can get some answers as to like why that would be. Yeah. We can ask like up the chain at Lamy. I don't know if I'll get an answer, but it would be good to. Sure. Maybe try I'm sure somebody would love to be to answer that. Like, finally, someone cares about my feed. <laughs> um, yeah. One thing I will say, I've cleaned hundreds of these things, mm. yeah, hundreds and hundreds yeah. of these things over the last 13 years. And not once have I lifted up that little piece and seen a massively offensive clog of yeah. shimmer or anything. Yeah. So I don't think that it's likely in any way that that would make this feed clog any more than a normal feed. If I have ever mm. seen a Lamy feed just caked with crap, it's been right at the front where the nib meets mm -hmm. up with the feed. That area gets a lot of crusty because that's very exposed. But back in the grip section, nothing's exposed. So you might see a ton of shimmer all up in the fins, mm -hmm. but not in that little ridge. Not once you lift up the thing, it's usually perfectly clean in my hmm. experience. I've never seen it totally gunked up. So whatever they do, whatever the reason, I don't think that it's design makes it more prone to clogging. And that's one of the pieces of the question. Yeah. So I would say, no, that won't make it yeah. any worse. Why it's there, we don't know, but it doesn't make anything worse. I can say that. Yeah, I am right there with you. I wish I knew more, but like you said, from a practical standpoint, honestly, you don't need to worry about it. Yeah. Like, I don't know that I've ever, other than for demonstration purposes to like look at it, I don't think I've ever taken the feed out and separated it and scrubbed it to clean the pen. I have thought, like I've I had, I've a, I've had a dirty Lamy feed. I'm like, yeah. well, let me, I definitely need to remove that like, little I piece. I bet this is going to be gross in there. Nope, never is. Huh. Never is. Well, there you go. So I'm always looking for it. Like, I bet you look under here. It's going to be so gross. Eh. No, it's fine. Okay. It's not that bad. No. Nah. Okay. Well, there you go. There you have it. All right. All right. Um, oh. Okay. Next question. Oh, right. Number five. Yeah. Let me turn my page. This here. is the one I'm not sure. Not sure how deep this one's going to go. Oh, boy. I did put a lot of notes in here, but part of that was like Mark Twain's thing of like, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter. So I copied a lot of notes in here to reference as I talk but I'm not necessarily gonna expound upon every single one of these. All right. S maybe, we'll see. Don't hold me to that. We'll okay. See, we'll see where it goes. Go ahead, go ahead. O okay. Go ahead and ask. <laughs> Red asks us, I've noticed that some inks when in a glass bottle will immediately flow to the bottom and leave nice, clear and clean glass. Mm. Other inks tend to just cling to the bottle and the glass above the ink level is forever that color. Is there a name for this property? And you know what, Brian? I've noticed the same thing happening in ink samples. You have yes. some ink samples that just slosh back and forth and leave a mm -hmm. clear plastic, and then some just coat the interior of that said sample. Or if you have a demonstrator pen, like a, yes. like a Twisby, and it's really obvious, some pens are like all clinging up on the side. Mm -hmm. And this has been a this has been something we've been getting asked for a very long time because it's it's a very visual thing. Like you notice it, and when you think about like oh, ink properties. <clears throat> Like, is there a relationship between how easy or hard a pen is to clean or how it flows or feathering or dry time? When you have something so visual, like clinging to the side of a thing, it's like, well, if I know that all of the really clingy inks are whatever, fast dryers or something yeah, like that, wonder. that could be handy when you're going to fill a pen so that you can kind of know, right? Well like most other things in the fountain pen world, uh -oh. it's it just depends. not that clear. <laughs> um, and again, I'm not like the foremost expert. This gets into some very sciencey things. So again, I'm gonna be flirting on the edge of what I actually know. I know enough to be dangerous. Flirting on the edge. Flirting on the edge. That's a, Is that a, that's not an expression. No, no, you doubled up, you doubled up too on that one, what but I, I like it. Yeah. That's like, you know. There's a name for that where you like mix like expressions. I don't know, but my together. wife. But there my is a wife, specific word for my it. My wife remember. did it one time, and we've been using it ever since because she's like she said something was a curveball at a left field. Yeah, which there's was a like, name for that. There which is, is a like name. you know you're doubling up. You're like a couple people right now are screaming at their a curveball is surprising, and something coming out of left field is surprising. But a curveball at a left field is even more surprising. Surprising, flirting with disaster is one thing. And then being on the edge of something is another thing. But flirting while you're on the edge of something, Brian, a malafor. 
It's called a malafor. Malafor. I think he was in Mortal Kombat when, Four. When two idioms, malifor. sayings, or colloquial colloquialisms are mashed together unintentionally, the sometimes hilarious result is what's called a malafor. Okay, so you can stop yelling malafor. Thank you. We got it. Stop. 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 But stop. if you knew what it was before I said it, you can say in the comments, "I knew. I knew that. I knew it." Right. They're like, "Yeah, he it. heard me." Yeah. He malafor, heard me. Brian. Stop acting like you googled it, Brian. You okay. heard me. Say anyway. malafor. Rachel does so many Malifors, it's hilarious. Yeah, she um, does. You've got a lot of them written down. We keep a quote book of yep. various things, and a lot of them are just Rachel Malifors. Anyway, okay, uh, where were we? Is there a name for the property? Um, you invented a few, didn't you? Yeah, I said clingability, <laughs> clingitude, uh, clingulation. I, like I don't know. I like clingitude. Cling is usually what I hear, kind of referred to it. I was thinking about like, okay, like in wine, when you like swirl the glass around and then the wine kind of like drips on the side, you say it yeah. has legs. Oh yeah, I've heard that. But that doesn't make any sense in a fountain pen context. No. And then you already got like baby's bottom and now you're throwing legs in there. I'm like, this is not where we, this is not the direction we need to go. It doesn't our, matter. There are so many euphemisms <laughs> in the fountain pen world. We just got to move past them or embrace them. Yeah. Well, it's not like inappropriate. I'm just like, why are we using like body part metaphors for various things? It's like, what it we know. know. Um, so, all right, I'll explain a little bit. Uh, when... When liquid clings to the side of the glass, it's called adhesion in like a scientific term. Um, so it's the tendency of a liquid's molecules to stick to the surface of the glass. High adhesion results from the liquid spreading out and clinging to the side. So basically the liquid itself is not, which is the opposite, not cohesive. It's not clinging to itself as much. So it's more likely to spread out. Therefore, it's more likely to cling onto other surfaces. There's also a relationship there that can happen with paper. But anyway, and I will say from anecdotally, I don't have like specific inks to recall because it would just require a little bit more research. We've talked about this before because we have obviously ink bottles and pens and stuff, but we have ink samples. That's a different material than glass. Yeah. We definitely have some inks that cling <clears throat> differently in sample vials versus they will in the bottle or in a pen. And you probably you may have noticed this too. Some inks will cling more in some pens than they do in other pens. What is going on? What is the deal? Yeah, so I don't really know all that enough to explain <laughs> what's happening there, but it has to do with like this adhe ad adhesion cling clingatosity. <laughs> Um, so the opposite of adhesion is cohesion. So that's when a liquid runs straight down, leaves no trace, you know, ideal situation. Like if you have a nice freshly waxed car and you want it just the water to just bead right off of it, you got a very cohesive liquid because it's sticking to itself in droplets as opposed to spreading out over the surface and clinging to it. Um, so there you go. Um, that tendency of liquids molecules to stick to each other rather than to the surface. Liquids with high cohesion will form droplets that run down without wetting the surface very much. So that, in this case, is what you would see as to if which one is better or worse. That's up for debate. So in addition to these, another term you might encounter is something called wetting, um, which describes how a liquid spreads out on a surface. This goes kind of to like the droplet thing on the car, like paint or whatever. Um, it is influenced by both adhesion and cohesion. So a good wetting liquid will have high adhesion. So that means that uh, it will spread out thinly and evenly, while a poor wetting liquid will have high cohesion and will form droplets. So um, I think I have mentioned this. I keep so many different trivia facts. I have a spreadsheet, I keep it all, but I have so many different contexts I use them in between talking to my kids and like various meetings we have internally, pencast, all that. Um, but there is definitely something called wet water that they use for fighting fires. Because when you're fighting a fire, you want it to spread out and cover as much as possible. So you want very high adhesion. So you want what's called wet water. So they actually put stuff in the water apparently. To, Extra water. To make it like the water not bond to itself as much, it wants to spread out and get all over like other things more. I don't know enough to know of how they actually does, achieve that. Where it kind of like we're getting there. Oh We're getting God. there. Oh, okay. Come down into the crevasse with me, Drew. I, I want to uh, know, like, <laughs> especially you neurodivergent folks, like, is it normal for people to keep casual spreadsheets? Because I, I hear that a lot, especially some folks that, that are generally like-minded of mine. You know, I have never in my life said, you know what, I need a spreadsheet for this. Unless I'm told to make a spreadsheet for something, I'm not... 
I, I never find my solution beyond a spreadsheet, but. I would say a spreadsheet is a tool, just like anything else. It's not necessarily indicative of one's abilities or one's motivations or anything. I just don't go there mentally. Like I never. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just not a spreadsheet person. That's okay. It frightens me. I, Rachel is like, she has spreadsheets like in her veins. I mean, I use like, spreadsheets every day to for make work, sure, but sure. like casually I'm like, that, that's oh, yeah. never been, but like my brother, like do spreadsheets for days, just yeah. in, a, in a hobby standpoint, like, oh, yeah. like, like yours. Yeah, sure. You know, he's like, I should probably organize my, these, these interests I'm like, in, a, in a spreadsheet. I'm like an ambivert equivalent of a spreadsheet person. Yeah. Like I can't go super deep and I'm not going in like multiple tabs and doing like programming within my spreadsheets. Right. That's but like just to, just to organize your more. thoughts though, you, you've. I definitely utilize spreadsheets. Yeah. Okay. So I don't want to deviate, but I just no, I find that so fascinating because. I definitely use spreadsheets in my personal life. Yeah, you do. For a lot of different ways. Yeah, you're, when it comes you're, to like organizing information. Yeah. Your, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, power tool maintenance schedules and stuff yep. like that. Like, yep. I manage that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All kinds okay. of stuff. I have various like personal budgeting stuff, like kids, Christmas gifts. Both our kids have their birthdays around Christmas time. Yeah. So we're dealing with them and all their cousins and all that kind of stuff. We kind of have to keep that stuff cataloged somewhere because otherwise we lose track. So yeah, we definitely manage uh, stuff in spreadsheets. Sorry, I just, yeah. that, that just yeah. struck me. It's all good. Um, so yeah, anyway, you have, that's a little side tangent thing with the whole wedding water thing with fires and all that, but that is, that's kind of a similar concept. Um, so adhesion and cohesion properties of fountain pen inks have a couple of different factors. So we're like inception. We're now going like a layer deeper into this. So the adhesion cohesion thing, there's a few different things that will influence the adhesion or cohesion. I promise I'm getting somewhere with all this. Uh, one is surface tension of the liquid, right? So surface tension is what affects the capillary action. That's what allows the water to draw itself, the water ink being mostly water. That's what allows it to draw itself through the constrained like feed channel and all that that process known as capillary action, it's because of the surface tension, it's desire to want to bind itself together. That's, a, that's allowing, allowing itself to kind of like work its way down those channels. Um, but you can have varying degrees of surface tension. Um, so it's a, basically a measure of how the molecules stick together. So inks with a lower surface tension tend to spread out more. So they have higher adhesion, lower cohesion. While those with a higher surface tension may beat up and have higher cohesion. That makes sense, right? So if they're like wanting to bond to themselves a lot, they're less likely to spread out, right? Sure. Just like if you really are like, you like the people you're with, you'll kind of all stick together and stay buddy buddy. And if you really don't like the people we're with, you're gonna give some space and you'll spread out. Yeah, I like that. Let's go with that as the people metaphor thing. I like it. I can relate. So surface tension, um, that's, that's a factor. Viscosity. So this refers to the thickness or the flowability of ink. This gets talked about a lot in terms of like ink flow, how viscous, like basically how thick or how thin is the liquid. Think of like maple syrup or molasses versus water, right? So like high viscosity, and I always get mixed up here. High viscosity means that it's thicker. So maple syrup is much thicker than water. Therefore it has a higher viscosity. So you think about it, if it's thicker, it's not gonna spread out as easily. Shocker. I bet dye can play a big role in that. It's literally my next bullet hey. point. Pigment and dye concentration. The amount and type of the pigment or dye in the ink can affect how it interacts with the surface as well. Higher concentrations can change the ink's viscosity and surface tension. So that's another factor, but we're not done. Would well, do you think more, <laughs> do, you, do you think a high viscosity will also make drying out occur quicker? Uh, Probably, I would think. If, because if you have like, if you have, you know, one milliliter of a ink with a lot of dye. Yeah. And one milliliter of an ink with not a lot of dye. Yeah. One of them has a higher amount of water in, in mm -hmm. it. Yeah. So one would think that the one with the more water would retain water even against evaporation. Yeah, longer. because there's, there's more water there. Yeah. So as water is evaporating, there's more water left. Right, so that's, starting probably, out with more. so that's probably what happens yeah. with like organic studio nitrogen. Like there's yeah. so much crap in there, you know, an average amount, an average fill, you have less water in there, so you have yeah. less to lose. Or shimmering inks, you know, that yeah. can be a factor too. Yeah. Yes, but that's not the only factor. Oh God, okay. There's more. Keep on, keep on going. So the next one, solvents. So the amount and the type of solvent used in the ink, the main one for fountain pen ink being water. Water itself is the solvent. It's the thing that, 
you are dissolving something into. Oh, okay, yeah. Basically, it can be alcohol, it can be acetone, it can be water. In fountain pen ink, it's water. So, yeah, so glad it's not acetone. Yes, acetone would be very bad for your pens. Don't put bad acetone solvent anywhere near it in any circumstance. Um, so the solvents used and the amount of it and all that, the type of solvent uh, can influence drying time and how it interacts with the paper. Some solvents can evaporate very quickly and affects how the ink spreads and adheres. Next one, you mentioned this already, surfactants. Basically, you know, soap. like soap, right? Detergents. Uh, these are compounds that reduce surface tension. So this is what often happens with inks that have a lot of dye concentration and a lot of extra just stuff, they usually add surfactants to it to break up that surface tension, so, get it flowing better. Nice. So if you if all else is equal and you had a bunch of fountain pen ink and you just dumped a bunch more dye in it, it would write a lot drier and you'd have harder starting and less flow because you're increasing the level of cohesion, mm -hmm. I wanna say. Not cohesion, uh, but but uh, the the, I'm forgetting the terms already. Whatever, viscosity. Um, so it's more likely to bind together, less likely to flow. But you counteract that with the surfactants because that breaks things up. I don't know if you remember this like science experiment in elementary school. It's like a young, this is like a pretty popular one, but you, you get a, a, a container of water and you put black pepper all over the top of it. And then you like get soap on your finger and you dip it into the water and mm -hmm. all the pepper just like, poosh, like mm -hmm. shoots away. That's an example of how that's happening because it will, you know, basically that surfactant will break down the surface tension and like cause things to just spread out, right? So that might be maybe, I don't know if that's what's happening with like the firefighting kind of a thing. Is the wet a, water? Yeah, the wet water thing. It could be, it could be surfactants in there that's doing that. Um, anyway, um, but that is often a, a not insignificant, you know, uh, ingredient in fountain pen ink because it's directly counteracting the natural properties of the dyes to want to dry things up. But you're still adding more stuff to the ink though. So that's the thing. It gets tricky. Like the more the stuff thing. you have in your ink, the more variables you also have in your ink. And yes. the harder it is to point your finger at any one element as the reason for a type of behavior. And this is why it's like the deeper you go down the rabbit hole, the more confusing it actually can I've always get. told customers, you know, you know, whenever, an, if an ink says it does a thing, like it does a thing because they've added stuff to that ink yeah. and you're introducing a bunch of variables. Yeah. So like, it's almost like when, when there's a problem and you introduce too many variables, the problem becomes unsolvable Yeah. because the amount and complexity, it compounds with every new variable that you and add. And we don't know what's in any of these inks. Like these ink <sighs> yeah. companies are not transparent about any of their ingredients. Very often not. Yeah. We don't have a single ingredient list for a single ink we've ever carried. No. Yeah, you're right. We know there's dye in water. <laughs> yes. Because that's obvious. <laughs> that's other, than it. That, other than that, we're we're pretty well theorizing yeah. about most everything else. I know salt, salinity, that is an that is usually a, a pretty big factor. I forget how that plays into <clears> it. I don't know how that usually there's some sort of biocide to prevent to prevent you know, like mold growth and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. But again, we're just guessing. Maybe right. there's not. I don't know. Yeah. And like how many, like what, what components of biocide, you know, do they know what's in the biocide that could have some properties that might change flow and surface tension, stuff like that. It's all very complex. Um, okay. So we mentioned surfactants. Um, this is something that I don't know how much it influences things like flow and like surface tension and all that, but um, the pH levels, like the acidity or the alkalinity of an ink. Uh, can affect its interaction, especially with paper. So when you're talking about like feathering and stuff like that, um, you know, I think the pH level can maybe uh, influence some of that like adhesion, cohesion kind of a thing. Um, paper quality and type obviously is a really huge factor, but that has less to do necessarily with the ink composition itself. So bottom line is there's a lot of factors really involved. And the problem, this is, I feel like I'm a broken record saying <laughs> this as we dive deeper into some of these things every week. Um, but the problem is we can't, we can't isolate any one thing and say, you know, if it has this particular property, then I know I'm going to, it's going to perform a certain way or whatever, because there are so many factors that all can overlap and interact and can do things, you know, just like you can add more dye, but then you add more surfactant. And you could actually end up something with a higher dye concentration that has 
more flow than something that has let, you know, so it's like, there's all these different things in there. And unless we were to get like a super detailed, like scientific breakdown of every component and all its properties, and even, even if we did, it would be like looking at like the human genome. I'd be like, well, I don't understand even what I'm looking at. You know, it's yeah, just we can't a bunch even, of We can't even figure out YouTube metrics. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, <laughs> It's, it's somebody out there might be able to understand some of that, but in in terms of practicality, it doesn't it doesn't really matter. Like some inks cling, some inks don't. If there is a pattern to it, I've not been able to recognize it. But then again, I haven't sat down with like all eight hundred inks that we have and said, let's map specific properties to how much it clings, because I think the clinging is more of a byproduct than it is an indicator of any type of performance. And it can be a byproduct of several things. Several things that all could have positive or negative aspects to how the ink would perform, especially because all of these, as soon as you introduce paper, now you've got a multitude of other factors involved because the paper itself has its own cacophony of factors that all interact with all of these ink properties that will totally mix things up. So basically you have some inks that are gonna to cling to the sides of things, some that won't. There's really not a strong relationship between how they'll perform and what they cling to that I've been able to tell. But now you at least have heard more words about it, <laughs> I guess. Yes. <laughs> and maybe we're entertained in the process. Confirmed. I said I was gonna use these notes and I wouldn't be verbatim. I ended up kind of using a verbatim, but. I think we all kind of expected that, Brian. But it's okay. That's okay. It was not a scary deep dive. This one I felt pretty okay with. Um, but anyway, that's it for the Q&A for this week. If you got any emails that you want to send us, especially if you're an audio listener, pencast at gulepens.com, hit us up. You can leave comments on YouTube as well. We always like hearing from you. That's it for the Q&A portion. And we've got a little spotlight, Drew. So uh, let's do that right let's. now. The first thing I want to show you, Brian, is, okay, we've got an Opus 88 Jazz here. And this is the one in the uh, Holiday holiday Jazz, so it's frosted. But look at this. This is an O-ring. We didn't even say what this was, did we? Sorry. This I guess is, we said at the beginning. I just said, yeah, Opus, Opus 88, 88 Jazz. jazz. Okay. This said, is the Holiday on. Jazz, so it's a frosted demonstrator. But look, mm -hmm. at, look at how they're packaging this single O-ring. That's very intentional. I like, I've never seen something like that. Yeah. I just love that. That, 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 that. I don't know, I love it. So as you can see, comes with an eyedropper. So this is an eyedropper pen. I can call it that even though I prefer the term barrel filler, mm -hmm. but this literally does have an eyedropper with it. So yeah. we can call it an eyedropper, I guess. So the Holiday it's Jazz- It's a barrel filler that comes with an eyedropper There you tool. go. Yeah. So the Holiday Jazz, in addition to its uh, black counterpart here, we also mm -hmm. have this in blue, um, is a Japanese style eyedropper pen. So what that means is that it does have a knob in the back, mm -hmm. but this knob does not operate. It looks like a piston or a vacuum. It does, but it's not, Brian. That is a, you ch see. That is a chunky rod. Look at that it thing. It is, it is. So it does have a rod and it is attached to a knob, but this doesn't do anything. This pumping action, you're not gonna yeah, I mean, really, you're not, you're not. It's, it's frosty, so you can't really see so no. easily, but like there's not a. It's not touching not a, the there's sides. There's not a piston seal. Right, it's not touching the sides of the walls. There. Yeah. But what it is doing, yeah, what is it doing? Show I'll us. tell you what it's doing, Brian. It is so curious, going to plug that little scoop right there. Okay. So why does this that matter? Little what is that doing? Gasket attached to the rod, uh -huh. when fully depressed, will seal off the grip section from the main ink reservoir. Right. So okay. once you get over this O ring, it's going to seal nice and tight. Yeah. So um. In this position, ink is flowing from here yeah. all the way to there. Once I tighten it down. It's a little frosty, so you're having to use your imagination yeah, a bit. So but now as it's tightened down. You see it's moving up there, it closes this that This gap. gasket, yeah, is flush against mm. this. So now the only ink we're using is what's already in here. So if we exhaust yeah. this, no ink from here is traveling anywhere. So for flying, for anything else, you know, we're not, we don't have this flow. Yeah, because there's a lot of ink. There's a lot of ink. Here. You're looking at a couple mils. And for eyedropper pens like this, keeping large volumes of ink separate from this is just a good idea because the larger the capacity of ink, the more variables and the more issues can um, happen with it. Mm. But depends on the uh, cohesion. Oh, yeah. Of the, or the adhesion. Of the ink. Yeah. So you just drop. <laughs> your ink directly into the barrel here using the handy dandy eyedropper or a handy dandy syringe if you have Does one matter? handy dandy handy. Quick question. Does Go it matter it. if you have the knob like in or out or whatever? Do you have to do anything with that when you fill it? Nope. 
Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't get, it's all sealed up in the back. Yeah, it doesn't get in the way. I so mean, you can, you, just, you can drop it down if you want to, but um, no, ink will easily travel around the gasket there, no problem. I guess I guess technically, if you're filling it to make sure you don't overfill it, you want the you want the piston up, right? Because you want that rod in there, because the rod's going to displace some. It amount is, of but, ink. It's, but it's going to displace displace the same amount whether it's up or down. I would just say mm. don't fi fill it past this level right here. Like yeah. don't 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 get it holds near. plenty of ink. You don't yeah. have to go. You're gonna be fine. Good to the last. Chill out, ink. yo. Yeah. All Do right. you remember off the top of your head how what the ink capacity is of this thing? Uh, 70 little tiny buckets worth. Oh, okay. Depending Very on the size of the buckets. buckets. Very yeah. tiny buckets. Um, we have it on our site. We don't recall what it is, but I want to say it's at least... It's at least three. Probably three mils. Things. Yeah. That's a lot of ink. Um, Ooh, look so, at this. And this is the Jazz in black. So if you didn't want the whole demonstrator thing, which Opus 88 does a lot of, you can have a blue or a black, like we see here, Jazz. Now, both the blue and the black Jazz operate in the same way. The profile is a little bit slimmer and they're both gonna have somewhat of an ink window. It's not a super helpful ink window. At best, you can see a little bit that the gasket is moving in and out. You can, you you can, can see an echo of something. It there. will basically say, do I have any ink in here at all? Versus yeah, you can't no tell ink. like what color it is. Right, or no, like you can that. basically see is it completely full or completely empty. But that's the, about it. That's not super unusual though. A lot of ink windows are. Yeah, like the Lamy two thousand is kind of like that. Like you're not really going to see your I mean, it's, level. It's clearer, but it's really small. Yeah. Like I'm thinking like Pelicans that have like that green ink window. Yeah. It's the same thing. You can't yeah. really tell. But same concept here. Uh -huh. Drop the ink in there. How much would you guess? Because it's like other pens that have like cartridge converter type stuff. You know, you have the feed and all that that goes right up to the back of that grip section. But it looks like this is like the grip in here is kind of hollow. You know what I mean? Like open yeah. that up again real quick. So I think that's where part of it, like I'm thinking about things like the Twisby Vax 100 or, you know, any of the Viscontis that have like the double uh, reservoir power fillers. You kind of are getting a double reservoir type thing, right? Because you're going to hold more ink in here than you would just in, an, in a, like a cartridge converter pen where it's just the feed, like what's in the feed. Yeah, It feels a, like there's a little bit more there's a in little, there. The, the, where this threaded area is probably a little bit of a, you know, but it's narrow, so it's not going to hold a lot more ink. Like this, yeah. this grip is mostly like, um, well, I mean, it's no more, uh, like we know that the feed probably comes up to about here. Mm -hmm. So what's here, yeah, might might be- a little, you know, yeah, a little extra. Yeah, I would say a little extra. So, but it's not like- if you don't have that knob, like it's not like it's sealed off and you have to open that knob every time you no, write. No, you really shouldn't. You really shouldn't. But I will also say that, you know, writing with the knob open, you know, it's long enough so that it doesn't, you know, scratch your hands or anything like that. Shorter right, pens, right. this, keeping it open like this could potentially grind up against your palm. But this yeah. pen is long enough without being posted that nothing's moving up against your palm. So See, it's that's, perfectly comfortable. This is one thing, this happens more with VAC fillers, like the VAC 700R and the Pilot Custom 823. They don't have as much of a reservoir. You're more like sealing up basically the back of the feed. Yeah. So there's a little less of a reservoir there. So you have to open the knob maybe a little more often, not all the time, but you can still write a decent amount. But I feel like this and like the Visconti double reservoirs and stuff, it's not like you, like if you write more casually and you're not sitting down for like a long writing session, you're not even gonna have to open up this knob. No. You'll just need to crack it open every now and then to drop some more ink down and then you close it right up and you can keep writing. So like, I know that's one thing with any pen like this where you have to open up the knob, like mostly back filler pens. Um, you're not gonna have to do that all the time. Yeah, so here we can see where the feed ends. Yeah, okay. You know, so you've got a good- you've got Oh, a so good it's amount. not all that much. Can I see the thing? Okay, so yeah. I guess it's not as much. There's a little bit in there. Yeah. More than your average cartridge converter pen. Probably. Yeah. And okay. like we mentioned recently, these pens have an excellent reputation for quality. We get very few, if yeah. any, returns on these pens for any reason. And as we recently learned, they seal really, really well. They do. So yeah, the, the clip is not going through the cap. Right. The clip is like, I don't I know, can, can, you, that can you unscrew it? It's, uh, it should be on there pretty tight. Yeah, Theoretically, you can, yeah. you can just unscrew that and... I know that's the way it is on the, the big ones. Yeah. The, the demonstrator. The demonstrators, yeah. yeah. Technically, this is a demonstrator, but then there's also a model called the model demonstrator. demonstrator. yeah. But yeah, they're pretty cool little pens. And the, yeah. uh, the and Jazz is stepping... What? I was going to say, these are not as big as the Opus 88 demonstrator no. pen model. So no. this is... For smaller hands, this will be a little friendlier. It is. And these are uh, round tops as opposed to the flat tops of the demonstrator. Yeah. And they're pretty light too, because there's not a lot of metal. I think they're perfectly balanced. Yeah. Yeah. But they're great pens. Worth a look. 
and uh, they've yeah. got a great reputation for quality that our customer care team really loves because they just don't have to deal with them. Because <laughs> they just work. Cool. Thanks, Drew. Yeah. All right. Let's do what's happening. Okay. I don't know how to cut that together because we didn't. That's not for. We that's, were just like that's talking. a problem for Tyler. Okay. Sure. We also don't have to say like now it's what's happening because there is like an intro thing. Yeah. Right with a title. Yeah. So really, we don't, we don't have to say like. No, not really. That, I don't know. It works. Don't. All right. Let's do what's happening. Okay. So what's been happening with me? I will try to keep this short. I've got a bunch of little random things. Uh, this weekend, I watched two movies with my son. Mm -hmm. Since last weekend, I didn't make him watch Mighty Ducks with me, but I requested it, and he very much enjoyed it, so great. Yeah. Um, this Did you weekend, watch Mighty Ducks 2 yet? No, I asked him. <gasps> I'm not, I'm not going to enforce it because I want okay. him to like it. Okay. I don't want to... Yeah. Because he is like his mom and that if it's not his idea, he just not going to like it. Mm, okay. It needs, needs to be his yeah, idea. And that's enough. fine. I know how to deal with that. I've been dealing with it for <laughs> almost 20 years now. Nice. It's fine. Um, so, yeah, we, he wanted to watch Sonic. So, great. We watched Sonic mm -hmm. the Hedgehog 1 and he got excited and wanted to watch Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Nice. Uh, the morning before we watched Sonic the Hedgehog 2, we made pancakes or I made pancakes. Mm. And sometimes I make him shapes because I have my little cake decorator squirty thing that I fill with pancake batter and oh, make shape. That's really smart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, I said, do you want a shape? He's like, yes, I do. I said, what do you want? He said, surprise me. So I made Sonic. So I drew a little Sonic the Hedgehog. Whoa. Yeah. That seems intricate. Uh, How did it turn out? It turned out really good, actually. Yeah? Yeah. I, you know, the, the, the outline needed to be kind of burnt so you could see it. But, okay. um, you know, it's Sonic's head. Wow. I had to make it kind of big because of the details. Yeah, I was going to say, but, like... So he's like, wow, this is really big. I'm like, yeah, me and your mom probably aren't going to get many pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> like, can we like eat, eat his, his hair or yeah. whatever? Like, you know, uh, he totally didn't finish it either. So whatever. Wow, nice. Um, we were going to have a Nerf fight. Didn't do that because mm -hmm. he needed to build a massive fort in his bedroom, which oh. I said, we're not going to do something until you take down that fort. It's got to come down. Can't have it all weekend. He's like, oh, okay, well, I don't want to take it down. I'm like, you don't have to. You can leave it up there all weekend. But just... I, he has to be prompted to clean up. So mm. I'm trying not to start new projects before he finishes another one. So it ended we, up staying all staying up all weekend. So we didn't I'll do her. interject here. Ellie does not like to clean her room. So we changed it to organizing. Mm -hmm. And that worked for a while, but now she's on to us. She's like, organizing just means cleaning. And we're like, <laughs> crap. Okay. We gotta change up our tactic now. Oh man. But maybe try that. If, you, like, you trying cleaning... to solve the Ellie puzzle is such Gosh. a challenge. Like you you we'll very yeah. regularly Talk. I think keeps earlier me, keeps us nimble. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, earlier today I mentioned something about mm -hmm. oh well you can do this and oh, you're yeah. like oh no Ellie will know. I'm like oh my god just oh yeah she definitely keeps you on your toes. Yeah, she's getting too smart for her own good. Archer did get a, a little laser tag set um, for Christmas and we played around with that. You know, oh cool. We ran around and shoot shooting each other. He was doing the clever slash cheating thing where he just kind of kept his gun behind his back so I couldn't shoot it and he'd like walk right up to me with his gun behind his back and just be like. <laughs> I have I have a very random memory. This is going to be a more personal thing. Oh. I have a memory of being at your house when we were in middle school and we were playing laser tag outside. Mm -hmm. And that's when we were told that Princess Diana died. Really? I remember was that. It, was it Because your mom came out and told us Princess Diana. I was like, who, what? I had no idea. But oh my I gosh. remember that that happened. First off, I don't play laser tag a lot. So it was already like a unique experience. But then her like interrupting our game to tell us Princess Diana died. And I was like, what is that all about? And then like learning a lot more about it. I was like, wow, that oh, was like wow. a moment in time. So I'd have a specific memory of being at oh, your health point laser tag. I don't have Princess that memory. Died. I don't have that memory. But it was, it was, I remember the laser tag set that I had. It was these kind of like gray guns, you know. I had one like semi-automatic and then a bunch of little handhelds. And yeah. you wore a little chest thing. Yeah, it was yeah. like a little get up. Yet, but I don't remember yeah. much about the tag itself. I just remember yeah. like being there when that happened. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that weird? I have no, I, yeah, that's Random crazy. Random memory. That must have been like 94, 95. When did that happen? Anyway. Um, so yeah, we did some laser tag. Uh, we took down all the Christmas decorations, took down the tree, put that up, put all the other stuff up. The outside stuff is still up because it was rainy and nasty and I didn't want to deal with mm. all that. So left that Nin up. 97. 97? August 31st, 97. I didn't know you came over that much, you know, that late. That was like middle school. I guess. All right. Maybe I'm hallucinating that, but. No, I, I guess that was, that was like, you know, I, Tamagotchi I pretty, era, Brian. That would have been 97. Perpetual, we perpetual been, hoodie, Brian. We'd have been in seventh grade, I think. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, we, we were in, we were in homeroom together yep. that, that grade. I remember. I think we also had Miss Curtis's science class together. <sighs> Could be. So I remember we had uh, South Park. It was really yeah, big. Yeah, you were drawing time. the heck out of some McLaren F1s. Oh, I found a journal the other day. I'll have to bring it in. <laughs> God, the amount that I <laughs> jammed that McLaren F1 into that notebook, it's really funny. I'll have to bring it in one 200 time. miles an hour, Drew. 200 miles an hour. I... Oh my gosh! Every opportunity you could tell <laughs> is one of those. And my Nickelodeon kid, director my studio. Kids, like Joseph does the same. Joseph does the same thing with like Sonic the Hedgehog. He's yeah. really into Sonic the Hedgehog, so he'll have like creative writing stuff in English class, and he just shoehorns Sonic the Hedgehog into there every get chance it. he gets. That's amazing. It's really funny. I'm like, like, wow! I did the same thing. Okay. Ride that wave, man. Yep. Anyway. Um, I reorganized the pantry at home. I brought the cereal from the top shelf, which is dumb, down to the middle shelf so Archer can make his own freaking cereal these days. Oh, I'm, I'm that like, makes why, sense. Why, hasn't, why haven't you been making your own cereal? Like, Because it's too high. I'm like, well, here you go. Boom. Also, when did your kids start clipping their own nails? Shannon and I were wondering about yeah, that. Like, yeah. When, when, when does that happen? Um, yeah, they're definitely doing it now. But like when? Like he, he's almost 10. Oh, he's around that age. Yeah, he should be able to do it. I'm like, yeah, he can start yeah. doing that. All yeah, right, we gotta yeah make him, we definitely. Gotta, we got to make him do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so some dog facts. I haven't had a Corgi update in a while. Oh, yeah. Um, it's pouring down rain right now, and I'm pretty convinced that our dog, Hank, the oh. three-year-old um, well, fa- not, father of Felix. Not going to pee, that's for sure. That, that's right. He's not going to pee all day. He's probably not going to pee all night. Oh, he my will, gosh. He's just, he just won't, won't pee in the rain. So we'll see. Felix, on the other hand, his son, um, the one-year-old, he will not look at the camera. He will stare at you all day long. He is a staring dog. He is a staring dog. But if you take your phone out and aim it at him, he will just like. <laughs> Look camera shy. He'll check, make sure. Like he'll, so he'll, funny. he'll side eye you. He does not like phones being pointed at him. Weird. Why yeah. is that? I don't know. Is it because like you're putting an object in front of you and him? Maybe. Like you're breaking eye contact? Maybe, but I tell you, like you try to get a cute picture of him, like lay in being all cute corgi, like no. He sees you. He'd be like, nope, nope, not doing this. Can you like stealth take it? Like, I've, I've tried, yeah? but man, he is, he pays attention. Wow. Terrible. Interesting. Anyway, I'll show a video of that. You need like get a, a phone case that's got like a picture of a dog treat on the back of it. That way you hold it up and it looks like a treat and he gets like, oh, maybe, there we go. Maybe? That's what I need to I don't do. Know. Um, then it'll just attack the phone. Um, it's coming from the non dog owner here. Yeah. I, I want to just mention that I wear jeans from. The moment I put them on to go to work until I basically go to bed. Yeah. Um, sometimes I do that with my shoes too. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, recently we were at TJ Maxx or Marshalls or something like that. We were returning a um, corgi piece of art that Shannon bought that where it was a corgi kind of like drawn like a some royalty with a crown and something. <laughs> And she loved it at the time, but she's like, no, I don't like this anymore. So mm, she took it back. It's a bit much. At, yeah. Mm. At first it was exciting, but then it was like, I'm, what am I going to do? Am I really going to hang this in my home now? Yeah. Um, so we were taking that back and I was looking and I decided like, you know what? I don't own a pair of sweatpants. I don't own a pair of joggers. I don't own a pair of comfy pants apart from pajamas. Like just so I don't, pajamas and jeans. That's it? Yeah. That's your yeah. entire. I don't have a pair of pants that I could just kind of like wear to like go to Dunkin' Donuts in the morning um, or like you my can, brother, my brother would definitely wear pajama pants to go to Dunkin' Donuts. I know you night. could, but I'm like, you know, like joggers are in style. Like right now, like yeah. those, I are, don't have any of those. Like what I, are joggers? Like, huh? They're like athletic pants. Like track pants? Yeah. Sort of thing? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. But like now they're tapered. They're not like the old Adidas ones that, you know. Right, right. You know, those things. So I was at Marshall's, I was like twelve ninety nine. You know what? Let me, let me, let me go ahead and. You branching out, Drew? I did. Because you don't wear shorts either. No, never wear so shorts. I'm still not going to wear shorts. So it's literally jeans and pajama pants. That's your entire 100%. lower half wardrobe. 100%. Wow. Yeah. Um, and even on days where I'm at home all day, I will put on jeans and go play video <laughs> games. Like, what's the option? Like, I'm not going to wear I, I, I feel Stay like. Stay in pajama pants? See, I go to sleep in like five minutes. And that's because I wear pajamas only to go to sleep. I get in my bed only oh. to go to sleep. So it's like a Pavlovian thing. I like, think so. Shannon will like pl- you know play games while she's in bed, watch Office. I'm just like no, sleep. I, Boom, it works. I kind of I kind of joke with Rachel because if I'm ever helping her like fold, we we do. There's a little life hack here. We used to like mix our laundry together and then wash it, and then we just had to sort it back out and mm-hmm. put it. And we was like, we're doing laundry all the time. Why don't we just wash our laundry separately? And then we save the whole sorting step. So that's what we do now, and it's wonderful. It's pretty efficient. Each yeah. of our kids, we wash it separately. Mm-hmm. We wash ours separately. We don't have to worry about that. Anyway. I like it. 
so I will like try to help Rachel out because I'm, I'm a more physical being. I like to do stuff all the time. She does. I've all, heard that about she you. She does a lot, but like putting laundry away, never something she wants to mm-hmm. do. So if I'm like trying to be nice or whatever, I'll like put her laundry away for her. But I, I kind of joke because I legitimately can't tell the difference between a lot of her clothing shirts, especially if it's pajamas or like regular shirts. Oh yeah. <laughs> because I like, I can't tell. Oh, Shannon has no organization <laughs> to her drawers either. Like, oh, yeah, I'm like, yeah. where do your, where do your jeans go? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right over there. I'm, I'm like, sure. what are you kidding me? I know. All my stuff is very organized, which you wouldn't guess looking at my desk at work. I'm. Oh, same. Yeah. I have my, I have all my shirts hung up in color order. How about that? And by short sleeve and long sleeve. Yeah. I have lots of stuff hung up. I have my socks in one drawer, my underwear mm-hmm. in one drawer you know, t-shirts folded, jeans in one area. Yeah. But I have a system when I'm putting clothes away. Mm. Um, Both my underwear drawer is slightly above my sock drawer. So I'll open my underwear drawer halfway, sock drawer all the way. 100%. And then I do the same thing with hers. Because hers on my left, underwear drawer, sock drawer. And then I can take all the underwear and socks and just boom, 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 boom. Yeah, 100%. I do the same thing. You do it? Same thing. Absolutely. Yeah, you betcha. Well done. Yeah. it's a It works, man. I'm just like flacking them. Bam, 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 bam. Yeah, definitely. Beautiful. Right there. Um, all right. So anyway, I got joggers. It's a new life development for me. Interesting. We'll see how it goes. I'm, have you yeah. worn them yet? Have you like? I did. Yeah. It was fantastic. And then my, my brother was like, hey, can you come over here and spot me? You know, my wife's out of town. I need to do some work on my roof. I just need you to be here. I'm like, I can just wear my joggers. Yeah. Because I'm just going across the street, just That's looking right. at him, make sure he doesn't die on the roof. Yeah. So I see the I see the benefit. I see the benefit. There you go. You know so, what's even better, Drew? Cargo shorts. Cargo, cargo pants. <laughs> Then you can got all kinds of room for they stuff. Did, they did have some, you know, I was I was said I'm not going to pay more than twelve ninety nine for these. Um, but they did have That's, some cargo sweatpants there. So I was like, ah. Joseph, that is all <laughs> I know. he wears. That's all he wants to wear is cargo sweatpants. That is marvelous. Um, yeah. I started Community. Um, I finished Parks and Rec, oh. started Community, another excellent NBC sitcom. Yep. In 2010, Brian, they had on NBC Community, 30 Rock, Parks and Rec, and The Office. Oh, I watched all of them. Like, w- there will happening. never yes. be a greater year on network television for the rest of humanity. That's a that's a, that's a a strong lineup. It's, it's not going to happen. Lineup. It's not going to happen. That was peak human civilization right there. Um, <laughs> and then uh, speaking of media, I, having heard the news of Best Buy discontinuing all of their physical media, video games, and oh, I didn't hear about do, do this. Blu-rays. Yeah, no more discs at Best Buy. I don't know about video games, but I definitely mean, movies. I'm not going to lie. For the last decade, I've been walking into that store being like, who's buying these? Me. I am still a physical media junkie. I, I, bought, I buy we, all we of my- We bought the Barbie movie, movie on physical media. I buy all of my video games on physical media. I yeah. feel like if I cannot sell them, I do not own it. Like that is possession to there's me. There's definitely something said for that. And there's been issues with, like, with the PlayStation Store where people have had movies they've bought no longer accessible to them. Oh, yeah. Like I don't like that. And mm-hmm. so now seeing this happen- I just got a, a, a 4K TV like last year. So I haven't been able oh. to watch a 4K Blu-ray before. Oh. So now I'm like, I need to start buying these things because at some point they're going to be produced much less and therefore be a premium. Oh, I see. Because it's like the advanced of the 4K, but in an older medium. So they're not going to be like producing. Oh, no, I'm saying like the advanced. No, I'm saying in any of it. Like, like I don't, I, mm. eventually new produced like movies NVIDIA. are going to, they're not going to need to make many of them. Yeah, but so, there's going to be, well, it'll be harder for new stuff if they're like not releasing new things, but like right. anything that's currently on a physical media. Like, but they're not going to make them if they think no one's going to buy them. Right, right. So, so I'm, I'm like, like moving forward in the future. Yeah, that'll be the case. All but the things. like All the stuff that's out right now, it's going to be easy to get for a long time because people are going to use the physical media less. Yeah, I hope so. The, the majority so, of people. I'm just realizing like I need to, I need to get, pick up some physical media stuff. Because I don't okay. like the fact that I can't. Because you, know, you got your VHS collection for 1984. Oh, that, we talked about I still, that. I still have a good amount of Blu-rays and DVDs, but I, okay. I'm missing. I'm missing some stuff. So okay. Um, so like, like, are you talking like classics, like things that like? I still have my classics. That like, you know, I'm not. I have my Rockies. I have my Lord yeah. of the Rings. My Back to the Future. Karate Kid. Ghostbusters. So they're okay. they're all okay. But you know, I would like to get some uh, 4K. Blu-rays and kind of just see some really crazy looking movies. Like I'd love to have Lord of the Rings on in 4K. I okay. want the newest yeah. Blade Runner. So I've got a list going. I started a list. It's a fine line to walk there too because I I don't I like I've long surpassed because like we had this business. I didn't have time to watch anything anyway. And then it was all just like kids shows and yeah. whatnot. So like the visual quality 
is like one of the lowest priorities I have in my life right now. I have for entertainment purposes. I have drawn back that. Like yeah. I used to always want the best quality, but then once some of these '80s classics started getting good, I'm like, yeah, it's a little too good. Like mm. I was thinking about the thing, John Carpenter's the thing, and. I was like, ooh, that'd be great in 4K. And then I realized, you know what? No, like that movie has some crazy, gory, nasty uh, practical effects. I don't want to see the details. Like yeah. that movie is it so- It might lose some of its magic. Yeah, that movie is yeah. so dark and gritty and nasty and mm. frightening. Like I kind of think that that shouldn't be too clear. Now, mm. I will say I did buy a 4K movie, my first 4K Blu-ray, and it was Aquaman with Jason Momoa. Okay. That movie, not a beloved movie. Most part, really, I I mean, I haven't seen it. It's silly. Shocking. It's it's very silly, but oh, okay. it looks amazing. It's fun to watch. It looks great. It doesn't take itself too seriously. Like okay. the the bad guy's name is Ocean Master. Like, but here's the thing: Patrick Wilson is such a phenomenal actor. When he looks at the camera and he says, "I'm Ocean Master," you're like, "Well, okay, Patrick Wilson. All right, Ocean Master. You are Ocean Master. I I believe it because he's that freaking good. So right. that's gonna be the thing. It's on its way. I'm Come gonna watch on. Aquaman in 4K. And it's also nice alphabetically. Yes, and I also don't own it already because, and I'm sure I can well, I can stream it somewhere. Right. But that it, was going to be my question: Is do you, you feel compelled to buy 4K versions of things you have in other media? Maybe eventually, not anytime soon. For like the really important classics, no. maybe like like Lord of the Rings. Yes, like the ones that yeah. like that's going to look good no matter what. I feel like those are the, those are going to be like popular enough where you'll be able to buy them yeah. in the future. And then like there's like a you know a Planet of the Apes three pack that I'm going to want to get because I love those movies and again those look fantastic. Yeah. Um, Hmm. Still looks good. Interesting. So anyway, that's currently all my mind. That's all what I'm obsessing about. I watched a couple of videos on painting Nerf guns. Quickly abandoned that. Like again, really? Because mm -mm, yeah, no. you brought it up last. I time. did, and I'm like, eh. so you watch more since? Then. I did. Oh, you're dipping, then, you're dipping, dipping your toe then, back in the then, water. But then, but then I'm like, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I do it. the same thing. Nah, I revisit not actually getting into yeah. certain hobbies, but I'm like. I don't know. Is it really that that? Bad? And I watch a couple of videos. And I'm like, yeah, this is a this is deep. Hundred percent. I, I, I can't actually. Hundred percent. That's exactly can't actually where I go went. there. Yeah. Yep. Not done. I got you. And then finally, um, uh, today when this pencast goes live, it will be the debut of my wife's cabaret. Um, she's oh. doing her first one woman show, singing songs, telling her story. Um, uh, all solo, just her and an accompanist on the piano. Cool. And um, so I'm going to see her Friday and Saturday. It's just a two night event. I'm going to take Archer on. Saturday, and I'm going to go by myself on Friday night, and I'm super excited. She's super nervous. She, I'm not allowed to talk about it because she's you don't want like to psych her out. No, no, no. She just tell me to shut up. Mm. I'm like, I'm so excited about Friday. She's like, stop. I don't talk about. It. I'm like, okay, because she's like, it's not 100 percent done. She's still kind of working out some of the it's in between never 100% stuff. 100 percent done. You know, no. What I mean? Well, that that's what she does. Like she she never... she's a ball of nerves all the way up until the show, and then she just kills it. She's amazing. She's wonderful. And I feel like that's part of the process. Because I did I did musical theater yeah. back in the day, and I did a lot of music performance. And no matter how much you prepare, you're always nervous because yeah. like you can definitely prepare and then blow it like in the performance yeah you know i'm sure it's like any sport or anything like you practice like crazy but you're still nervous about in the moment yeah it's and natural. then this is just just her like just her standing yeah, up there that's just just the shannon that's a lot. Show. yeah i don't think i ever had to perform a solo oh it's horrifying to me thing. but like yeah that's yeah good but on it's, her, cool. it's that's... not it's not like in a theater it's like in it, it is at a theater but they've mm. got the theater room and then they've got this kind of like dining area where it's you know probably like 50 tables or so um and you can have light hors d'oeuvres and watch the performance hmm. and you know there's a bar so it's a very yeah. cozy atmosphere so cool. i think it'll be fantastic i'm super looking forward to it um but uh, she's stressing out but uh yeah she'll be fine yes she will yeah. so yeah that'll be uh kind of the highlight of my upcoming weekend it's awesome it's ironic as we were talking about that i was like we are pretty much performing when we shoot these videos i don't think so it's different though it's totally it's not different. a performance if it was yeah. a performance, I wouldn't be able to do it. It's performance in terms of like the exposure. Like there are people watching us. Yeah, right but I've now. got stuff to say. Like, if I was being told what to say, I wouldn't be able to do that. Well, she's got stuff to sing. That's true. I guess that's the thing. Like if she, I guess it's about like she wants to do it and it's her decision. Well, I guess it's different. Like, I don't know. For me, at least music is different because music is timed. So it's like you don't necessarily have the same flexibility yeah i'm like i'm not so i'm like, not if you play a wrong note you can't like go back and redo it if right. i say a wrong word i can correct myself right we're not doing anything skill-based here we're just 
we're got just that talking. right. We're just talking to our friends. Yeah, it's different um, with music, though. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. This, Good on her. She's going to do great. Yeah. So That's awesome. What about you? What are you up to this weekend? Or what did you do last <sighs> weekend? I had one of the most uneventful past weeks. So I have less to talk about in my what's happening than maybe ever before. We'll see. I just did. A, <laughs> I just did a bunch of random stuff, just like normal homeowner parent type stuff. Ho hum. Yeah. Like <clears throat> I built that shelf. I think I showed a picture of that last week. We hung it. So Joseph has stuff on it now. That's cool. I'm in the process of doing another one. Cool. Great. It's a wood shelf. Who cares? Um, my sister's family came over. So that was cool. They, we had illness over Christmas. So this was like a delayed Christmas birthday, all that kind of stuff. Wait, your sister? So we did that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Her, I thought it was Rachel's sister that was planning on coming down this whole time. That was different. We were going to go up there. Oh. And we didn't because of illness. Oh, okay. My sister also had illness in her family. Oh. We had separate plans to see. Him. Oh, my God. It. Yeah. So okay. just, illness wrecked all kinds of stuff Yikes. for a lot of people around the holidays. So we finally did the <clears> delayed <throat> thing. So we hung out. Played some board games and stuff, you know, just kind of chilled, hung out, and had a good time. Um, found out that their whole family plays Bloons TD6. So we did a four player co op game with my nephew and oh my, God. my sister and my brother in law. And how psyched were you when you learned that? I was pretty psyched. Was it your idea to do the co op? No, it was my nephew. Really? Yeah, he was all for it. Huh. Yeah, it was pretty fun. I'm not nice. Gonna lie. I'm not going to lie, it was pretty fun. I've, were you merciful on everybody? Well, we were together. We were playing as a team. Oh, so it was oh, like co-op. Of course, that's what we, that yeah, means. Yeah, we were all yeah, yeah. So we all played together and we crushed it. Nice. Yeah. So that was fun. Or you popped it. We popped it. Yes. Popped pop it. pop. Yep. Um, so that was kind of cool. Fixing all kinds of random stuff around the house. I have. I realized I like missed cleaning the air filters in my house for longer than the period that missed it meaning gone. you longed for it or yes, missed meaning you so overlooked much. for it. <laughs> yeah, but I like you know changing house filters and stuff like that. I've talked before about how many filters I have to manage in my life. It's a lot of them. Well, I had to deal with some of these and it was like, I just hadn't thought about it for a while. And I looked at the filter and I was like, ooh, that's looking pretty, it's looking pretty grimy. I was like, that is no longer anywhere near the color it was when I put it in there. And I was like, shoot, how long has it been? I actually write the, the day that I, re that I replaced it on the filter. Mm -hmm. Cause I, you have all yours like in your, your HVAC unit, right? It's just one big filter and you replace it. Or I just have, do you have like I just have one wall filter. Okay, I have three different wall filters Jeez. that I have to do, and then we have like a little mini split. Yeah, and it's never dirty either. Really? But I've got this weird area, like huh. the the under the stairs. There's an opening, like I guess it's a storage area, but you can only access it from inside the closet. Oh, interesting. Like yeah, there's okay. a coat closet. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a door behind the coat closet Ooh, like that a goes into the passage. Yeah. That's so and cool. in, in there screwed to the floor is a grate with no filter where the air is coming up, filling the whole void of under the stairs. And then there's- I feel the, like that air should be flowing somewhere. Well, it does. It flows outside through oh. the wall through where the, the filter is. Through the what? Through the wall? Well, the, the wall where the, where the filter and the grate is. So there's a permanent grate affixed to the floor where the duct is. And then there's this chamber and then it comes out the wall where the filter is. Interesting. Yeah. It's weird. I mean, okay. It's like they're using the understair area as like just a massive, like it's just the end of the pipe, but there's nowhere <laughs> for the air to go except for out the filter. Yeah. Great. Okay. So it works. That's, inter that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I guess it kind of, some of it probably goes under the door and into the closet, but uh, probably not that much of it. Probably not that much of it. Yeah, it's gonna take the past leader. It's just resistance. weird. I've never seen that. Is interesting. Like that. Yeah. yeah, they probably probably could have connected a pipe and just didn't. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> but you can't put much in there because otherwise you're yeah. gonna cover the floor. Great. Interesting. So you can't really use it as storage either. But it's air blowing out. Yeah. Because see, no, 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 no. It's not. It's not. I was gonna say it's got to be going the other. It's way. It's gonna go. It's going the other the way. Filter and then yes. it's sucking air it through is. the yes. filter. Sorry, okay. I said the wrong thing. Yeah. It's okay. Sucking, sucking it. So you got a giant sucking hole. Yes. <laughs> mysterious yes. closet. Yes. Closet closet. It's like a double closet. Yes. And then that door will also slam shut if the air is running. Yeah. Because it's sucking air yeah. the whole time. That's weird. <laughs> it's super weird. That's really weird. I don't know why they would have designed it that right. way. That's interesting. Okay. Well, Sorry. that filter should get junked up because you should have stuff floating in there. Yeah. That's the only filter you have in your house, huh? I think so. 
I mean, you would know if you had others. You can <laughs> see them on like they're on the wall or the yeah. ceiling or somewhere. I think it's the only, interesting. Unless, unless there's one in my HVAC unit that I don't know of, but uh, I feel I like think that's used, just a furnace. Yeah, interesting. Huh. Well, I know I don't have one in my HVAC unit. I have three different ones that are three different sizes, which is a real treat to manage. Uh, and they were like black. So I was like, whoops, I'm normally way on top of it. And I just hadn't, but we also have air filters that are like in the room and all that kind of stuff. So like we got a lot of filters. So anyway, yeah, that happened. Fun. But yeah, just boring stuff. I'm like, why am I even talking about any of this? All right. It's all boring. Your story was interesting. <laughs> Mine is not. Um, been playing a lot of board games with the kids. It's like a more regular thing that we're doing now. Catan really kind of kicked things off. Nice. Lots of Uno. Um, did I, have I talked about Giant Uno? Did I mention this at all? I don't think so. Okay, so one of the, there were two things that I bought. Okay, so the way that it worked this year, usually Rachel's on top of like gifts and stuff like that. The way that it worked this year, Rachel basically like was on it Black Friday. She was like super on top of the gifts and stuff. So she basically bought like all the gifts for the kids, like super early. And so I'm like, great, I don't have to worry about that. Yeah, that was me this year. Yeah, um, but as I was shopping for gifts for like other people, I was like, oh, it'd be kind of fun. I got a couple of like family, like super easy gifts. One of them was a automatic card shuffler. Oh, good. Because I am the card shuffler in the family and I'm not that great at it, but I'm just the only one really willing to do it. So, you know, it's just kind of annoying. So I bought a card shuffler mainly for myself, but also so that like somebody else can shuffle the cards. Um, so we use that a lot, especially for Uno because the decks are so thick. It takes freaking forever to shuffle those by hand. Hmm. So to have an automatic card shuffler, you just split the deck, put it in the two halves, push a button, and it just <laughs> throws them all together. I'm like, this is awesome. Nice. So definitely enjoying that. And then the other thing that I got that was sort of a gag, but has turned out to be way more real, um, was like we bought Giant Uno, which is like basically think of like an A5. You have to shuffle those yourself. It's like an A5 notepad. That's how big these Uno cards are. I've They're seen, I've, massive. I've seen them. Yes, we bought that. I bought that. Rachel would not have bought it, but I have to shuffle those. Yeah. And there's no way to do it other than like one at a time. Uh. Like got, it's like, it's it's painful to shuffle those oh. things. So it's like, if the kids really want to play it, or they have a friend it. over or something yeah. like that, like oh, we'll do it. But I'm like, kids, don't just, don't just play this game with these giant cards because it's such a pain to shuffle. But anyway, it's still pretty funny and they got a huge kick out of that it. That is awesome. Um, but you know that, I've been keeping up with the saxophone, playing that regularly, enjoying it, nice. getting better. I'm not even like practicing a lot of songs. I'm doing scales, hmm. just fundamentals. Just like, I, I want to get really, really good because just like anything else, just like doing like handwriting drills. Like it's not fun to like do the same letter and over and over again. But once you get that muscle memory in there, it's going to make your progress better for everything else. You so know, you have to be Duke Silver this Halloween. Oh, I've already talked about that. Good. Duke Silver and or like Bill Clinton. like Duke Silver, you're a woodworker slash saxophone I know. guy. Like, come on. I don't have the mustache, but I could get a press on mustache. Yeah, you can get a mustache. Yeah, or you can, can not shave happen. for a little while and then just use your trick of... Uh, not going to happen. Rachel's not going to... She allowed it that other happen. time. I don't want to just like have a mustache. I look really... I have a picture of me with a mustache. No, it was, Maybe I'll throw it in here if I can. It was the one blind. when you we were, uh, you did. Oh, when I did a John, Robert John Goulet. Lane. I did John Lane and Robert Goulet as well. Yeah. Yeah. That was fine. That was that. like just a week's worth of growth and Yeah, and then throw some in. mascara yeah, on it. Yeah, you do that. That's I fine. I can do that. I could do that. Yeah. But I could also press on a mustache. And yeah. It's less work. That's true. <laughs> I don't have one though. I had to find a mustache. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So Duke Silver. Yeah, I could. I think that's definitely the the strong contender. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's it. It's been boring. Rad. Yeah. That's cool. Been no, carrying, we're, we're... carrying around dirty pens in my backpack. And... <laughs> <laughs> Fun stuff. Cool. Um, we got a couple quick company cup. Blah, 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 blah. Company cup dates. Company cup dates. And then uh, we'll wrap it up. Well, we have a video that we got out this week. I think. I hope. It's always like a little sketchy when we haven't like fully gotten the edits done and everything. We're pretty sure we're going to have a video published by the time Friday rolls around um, of the pilot varsity versus the emperor. In Mortal Kombat. Yes. 1v1. Um, it's a it's a little clickbaity kind of title. It'll be a $3 versus a $12,000 pen. And we're going to sword fight with them. And I'm going to do it. And uh, yeah, it's going to be fun. And Brian is going to use a hammer on one of them. Now that I think about it, I might end up using the hammer thing in both videos because I shot the Varsity and the Emperor video as one thing, and then I shot the refilling the Varsity. Maybe the refilling, I may have misspoke. I think the refilling Varsity, I may not have the hammer in there. I think that's for this video. 
We'll find out. We need to find out when hammer time is. If only there was a song. I think I just need to work. I just need to incorporate more hammers into videos naturally. Just I as mean, a nod to the pen cast. Oddly enough, you brought in that hammer and I used it in one of my videos you too. You did use the hammer. Yep. I mean, if it's there. I mean, if, when you can uh, when you can smack a pen with a hammer, I'm not going to lie. It's a pretty good time. Yeah, we both smack <laughs> some pens with a hammer. It's a good time. Um, and then also we're going to be closed this coming Monday, Martin Luther King Jr.'s. Uh, birthday. So we will be closed, but we'll be back open on Tuesday. So if you're placing an order over the weekend, it'll be delayed for a day. But we appreciate your patience there. And we'll wrap it up. And I got a fun fact. Thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us questions. Gooleypens.com. That's your place to check out pen, ink, paper, and all the things. YouTube, Instagram, check them out. So my fun fact, Drew. Yeah. Is a video game thing. Ooh, I like video games. I would, I would have to believe that a good portion of our audience probably already knows about this. Are you calling them nerds? I'm calling them enlightened, oh, conscious, aware that's nice. of the more important things in this world. Um, no, not really. So when I saw this kind of come about in my in my feed uh, about someone beating Tetris, ah, I yeah. was like, oh. Got to the kill screen. Yes, the true kill screen. So Drew, this this goes deep. We so don't we found, don't we don't need to go deep though. We won't go super deep on it. But it's the so this game on Nintendo. It's been out for thirty four years. Super so not super sorry. NES, the original Nintendo. Yeah. There are tournaments and there's there's a whole subculture into playing the Nintendo version of Tetris, and it's it's a whole thing. And I just say, I did not, I was not, it makes sense to me. Like Tetris obviously has been around forever. It's competitive, like I get it. I had no idea just how seriously uh, this community of people took this. But I appreciate it because of what we do here. I, I appreciate so much of what it is. And I also like flirt with the Rubik's Cube world as well. Very similar. On the edge? Very similar vibe, flirt on the edge, yes. To go with that Malifor. Uh, it's very similar vibes to what happens in the cubing world um, where there's like, you know, people who are like really competitive and they're developing like these very specific techniques that then like up the game and a whole new set of records are set and like all that kind of stuff. Same things happen in Tetris. But, you know, I was not aware of any of this until I until this recent thing happened. And I'm sure a lot of people are talking about it now, but it's really cool. Um, so basically on the original version of Tetris on the Nintendo, you know, basically level 29 is the fastest that it gets. It doesn't get any faster than that because it's so fast, you can't even get the piece over to the side before it has dropped to the bottom. It's that fast. So they had to have like, like a, there was like a double tapping technique that you'd use on the controller to be able to get over there. And there was like a whole series of records that were set there for a while. And then what was called the rolling technique which is like literally you take your fingers and they like wear a glove to like help with the, the right amount of friction. And they like hold the controller on their leg and they like roll their fingers like in a, like in a one, two, three, four, like a quick kind of thing. And they're using the rolling of their fingers along with the tapping to be able to like, like basically triple quadruple tap fast enough to be able to scroll it over to the side and drop the thing where they want. How can they even... It's amazing. Process information that fast. It's amazing. If you watch them play, and these are all like teenagers basically, um, but you watch them play and it's, it's just looks so effortless. It's so fast. It seems like it's just automated. Well, like cubing kind of like, looks like that too sometimes. Cubing definitely. So that's why you it's watch like such that, a similar You're like, I don't vibe. even know what you're doing, but it's, that's amazing. It's a similar vibe, but yeah. obviously they've practiced a ton. Mm -hmm. But what was what I appreciate about this so much was because there's limitations to the code and the RAM inside the device, there's people that have like broken down and calculated like all the like theoretical possibilities and all the different ways that you did. So there is, there really is no like end to the game. There's really no like, congratulations, you've beaten the no, game. No, you just break it. Yeah, basically that's the thing is like, they take the game so far that like it gets to the point where you know, there's a specific color scheme to each of the levels, but then once you get past where they've programmed that color scheme, it wasn't meant to really handle that. So then it starts to just start doing weird things. So they like mapped all these weird colors and weird things. And there's some that are like partially ghost colors and like almost impossible to see them. And so there was like ceilings to the records that would hit because it would be this like 
like green and blue kind of outline, but the inside was black. Like the thing was just like fritzing out because it was maxing out the capability of the game. But people were trying to basically push the limits of the like the the code and the device to where it would literally just it would lock up because it couldn't handle it anymore, and that was like what you consider beating the game. But no one had ever actually reached that point. So no one had reached in that reached that point in what they call like the true kill screen, which is where like you end up breaking it. There's other things that can sort of break it, and it, there's all these things that get into why, but. Uh, this what I forget how many days ago this past week or whatever. he just like reached the the, uh, the score that yeah. would break it. Well, it wasn't a score. It was he reached a certain level. I mean, I'm not joking. In order to like break it, you had to get to a certain point, have around a certain score, and then you had to have like this right combination of like the number of lines that you would get. So he was like at a certain level and had to do it where like he like before he got a full Tetris, he had to do just a single line. And this is all happening while pieces are literally just like flying down the screen and you're like rolling and all this kind of stuff. And you have to be thinking about all this. It's incredible to watch. I appreciate it so much, even though it doesn't matter at all. But anyway, so this kid, and it was like all these like really, really good competitive Tetris players were all like basically like at that point where it, they were realizing it was possible to do this. And then this like one kid ended up doing it. And he li was live streaming while he did it, which is why the whole community is like Yeah, I did see up. that video yeah, of him so reacting. He's a 13-year-old kid. I don't know if I actually know his name, but Blue Scooty is his handle. Um, and he reached that true kill screen on level 157, which just imagine like this whole rolling and pieces flying all that. It, it takes like 40 or 45 minutes playing straight through without dying to get to that point. And I guess the point where like literally you have to Calc each level you have to calculate how you even like how many lines you get and stuff to to like break it in the right way I, it's really complicated but it has to do with the code and all that kind of stuff but you're talking spreadsheets people have like broken this down like literally down like to the bits and bytes of the machine it's kind of amazing i super appreciate it but that's what all the hoopla is about um is that that was the first time since the game's creation that someone had actually like beaten the game like that so Kind of neat. So go look that up. Um, there's a really cool video that I found, but there's a ton of them out there on YouTube that explain all this. But I found one that like broke it all down. And so we can link to it if you want I'm to. Geeking out. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. I have no affiliation with anything related to this, but I just appreciate it as a nerd lover. So there you go. That's it. That's what I got for today's fun fact. You can beat Tetris. That's all we got for this week. So I want to thank you all for watching. Thanks for spending time with us. Hope you have a wonderful, excuse me, have a wonderful next week. Stay high and dry and right on.